Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, it's, uh, it's time for us to do more proc macros because uh, I, I ran a poll and everyone wanted more proc, proc macros, so that's what we'll do. Um, I also ran a poll about whether people wanted to see chat in the video and uh, the consensus was that we should not have it. Um, keep in mind that if you are watching this sort of after the fact on YouTube, uh, there is a link in the description, description below that links to the live version of the video, which will have the chat on that side, that side uh, while you watch. Um, and so that'll be kind of neat. Um, so before we get started on today's stream, um, I also want to point out that um, I tweeted this uh, a few days ago that uh, I used to have a Patreon for this work that I do and realized that I'm not allowed to have that in the US um, because I'm not allowed to have any source of income outside my studies. Uh, and that was a bummer. So I've been trying to find a way because a bunch of people have been asking me how they can sort of support my work. And uh, and so I've decided to set up an Amazon wish list um, where people can like, if if you want to like donate something to help make the stream better, you can do so. Um, and I posted this a few days ago and I've already been just overwhelmed with the responses. It's been really cool to see people just like strangers on the internet sharing things with me. Um, and so to all of the people who have sent me things, thank you so much. I appreciate it a lot. It, uh, it makes me, uh, uh, yeah, it's great. It's it, I very much appreciated. Um, and so there's a list where there's some small things and some large things. There's a bunch of D and D stuff because I like D and D. Um, and so if you want to buy, buy me stuff from this list, then that would make me very happy. If you can't, that's okay too. This is just the only way I could find where there's some way of showing support, um, but even just like your thank yous mean so much to me. Um, I also want to remind you about the live coding voting site. Um, so I'll post this link in the chat somehow. Um, in fact, how will I even do that? I'll do that this way, like so. Um, so on the site, you can vote for upcoming stream ideas. Um, it, my guess is this will be the last proc macro stream. Uh, and so the next stream, unless things change, is going to be a second open source contribution stream. We did one of these a while ago. And the idea here is basically um, I spend like the five hours or so that the stream goes for uh, um, trying to contribute to a number of different open source Rust projects. And I'll sort of solicit opinions from you, the viewers, as to which projects we should contribute to. Um, and it can be small contributions, large contributions, whatever we feel like we want to do. Usually what we'll do is try to find less developed projects and then look at issue trackers, for example, and then try to find a thing to contribute. Um, let's see, before we start, uh, mm, okay, so there was a question here. Uh, do you have any videos implementing event loop? Um, so some of the future stuff is event loop based. You could try that. Uh, I couldn't have a Patreon because as a, I'm on a student visa in the US. And so uh, I'm not legally allowed to have any source of income. That is not basically my um, uh, the assistantship that my university pays me. I'm not allowed to have any other source of income. Um, OK, so let's drive, dive into procedural macros again. Um, I'll try to get better at like reading chat aloud as well. Um, so I'll be monitoring that in the background. So if you remember from last time, we started working on David Tolney's um, procedural macro workshop from the Rust uh, LATAM conference. Um, and we basically did the very first exercise of deriving a builder pattern. So the way this looks is you want to have some kind of struct and you want to be able to put derive builder above it. And what our macro does is basically generate the code to have a builder for that thing. Um, so if you remember back to, let's see if I can find this. Um, mm, let's go with builder, just to sort of bring us back to where we were. Uh, 09? No, let's do 08. Builder 08. No, builder 07. Great. So the idea is that if you have some code that looks a little bit like this, 
So you have a struct with derived builder and you have some fields with different types. You might even have um, things that are vectors, for example, where you want a builder to have a, a builder argument that just gives you a singular thing. You, then that should give you a builder type that you can then use this stuff on. And so to remember, the procedural macros basically take as input. Oh, what did I do? I did a stupid, did I? Um, the procedural macros basically take this program as an input, sort of a stream over the tokens of this program as an input, the things that have been annotated with Derived Builder, and then produces an, uh, uh, a stream that adds new tokens to the stream. So what that means is it basically expands the program. So in this case, Cargo Expand shows us the expanded version. So here we have the um, we have the command that was in the original source. Remember the builder, the derived builder attribute has now been removed because it's already been parsed. And what we generate is a new struct command builder with the same fields, um, a bunch of methods on that builder, and a build method that produces the final command. Um, and so what this means is ultimately this generates all the code that's necessary to make the, uh, the um, operations that the user gave us work out. Um, so the question is, if we go back to our list here, the question is what, what exercise do we want to do next? My hope is that we might be able to do maybe two in the five hours we have, um, given that the first one basically taught us a lot of the concepts that we're going to need in order to do these. And then the other ones are sort of expansions upon those topics. Um, so let's do a quick straw poll in chat here. Um, let's, let me first briefly go through the options. So there's derive custom debug. So the idea here is that um, you know how you can have derived debug on a struct? Custom debug is going to also let you define how you want different fields to be debug printed. So in this case, this would say print the bit mask using this format. Uh, so that would be one macro we could implement. Uh, another is seek. So the idea of this macro is that you can give the seek macro followed by basically an iterator um, and then a segment of Rust code that will be uh, where we're going to look for this pattern, this like pound open bracket, similar to like in macro rules. And what's inside there will be expanded n times where n is the iterator with pound n replaced with the value of the iterator. Right? So this would generate like CPU 0, CPU 1, CPU 2, CPU 3, et cetera, all of them as variants of processor. But it doesn't have to be inside of a, an enum. It could be all sorts of different things. Um, pound sorted uh, is going to be a compile time assertion that the variants of an enum are ordered. And so if you put pound sorted on an enum, then if the enum variants are not sorted, it will be a compile time error. Um, bit field uh, is, I see, you basically define how many bits each field takes up. Uh, and then the, the attribute lets you access those fields and set those fields appropriately and make sure to store them using whatever the appropriate um, integer type is. Uh, and my guess is that the bit fields one is probably a decent amount more complicated. So looking at the project recommendations here from David, um, custom debug is gonna look at trait bounds, seek is for custom syntax, right? So normally we've been using the, the syn crate for parsing out Rust syntax. In the case of seek, we're going to have to basically walk the tree, the syntax tree to find places where we need to replace the main variable, right? So this is basically like custom index parsing. Uh, sorted is mainly for looking at how to get good uh, diagnostics from a macro. And bit field, yeah, so bit field do only when you have a strong grasp of at least two other projects. Um, so I think we should, we might do bit field today, but we should not do it first. And so I think the options are, do we want to do sorted? Do we want to do seek? Or do we want to do derive custom debug? Um, all right. So votes, who thinks we should do which? Uh, specifically, 
out of these three and not bit fields, we might do bit fields after, but I think we should do at least one more to like get back into the group of things. Um, so there are seek, seek, seek is probably rather pronounced like sack than seek. Sec? Maybe. So the reason I pronounce it seek is because it's sequence, right? Seek, sequence. It's not sequence, right? Or sequence. But I don't know. Uh, sorted looks nice and easy. Custom debug, sorted, seek. Okay. It looks like there's sort of a tie between sorted and seek, maybe? I think seek looks like the contender here. Okay. So let's go for seek first, and then we can always do the others later. I agree that um, sorted is probably f uh, easier, right? Because it, it on it's only like enum variants and checking whether they're sorted. All right, so let's get started with seek. Function like macro seek. Um, so the idea here is we're going to be given a uh, <laughs> sequence. Um, we're going to define a function like macro seek, right? And it's going to have the format like this. This is going to have to require numbers. Uh, stamping out sequentially indexed, sequentially indexed copies of an arbitrary chunk of code. Uh, all right. So. Great. So we're going to have to parse basically this followed by um, an identifier, the keyword in, a numeric range, curly brackets, and then just regular code. And then inside of that code segment, we're going to have to look for this. Um, so let's see how we might do that. So the syncrate, uh, if I remember from last time, has a visit thing, which is basically a way to walk a syntax tree. And in this case, we want to mutate the syntax tree, right? Actually, unclear. Is that what we want to do? I think that's what we want to do. Because we want to replace, we want to replace the occurrence of this with the expansion of it, right? So visit mute. Um, so I think the idea here is is it mute? Uh, this is uh, not at all documented. That's potentially unhelpful. Uh, I wonder how we're supposed to use this. So does it say visit anywhere else here? Mm, not really. Actually, maybe visit is documented and visit mute is not. Let's take a look at visit. Mm. That seems relatively unhelpful. Is there a visit token stream maybe? Like a top level entry point? Huh. Are there provided methods for this? Where? Oh yeah, um, that's a good point. All of these uh, things from the workshop are actually, there are real implementations available of them. Uh, I don't know where they're linked. I think if you read this more carefully than I did. Um, basically all of these exercises, there's a crate on crates.io by David that implements this feature. Um, and the real question is where is like the top level entry point? Where do we start? Is there a, there's no like, uh, is there a token tree? No. Um, interesting. Oh, maybe there's a parse, a variant of parse that takes visit. Parsing a custom syntax. Lazy static example. Great. Take a look at that. A 
implement parse. Well, we don't want syntax that's actually this might be useful for parsing the um this might be useful for parsing the top level thing, right? So oh, why is it not giving me the seek? For parsing this business, right? That business uh, is sort of like lazy static in that we'll want to parse a particular sequence of tokens. Okay, so that works decently well. Um, mm -hmm. Giving error messages, that's fine. The real question though is, ah, oh, this still doesn't really give us uh, the visit pattern. I'm like fairly convinced we want the visit pattern, but the question is how do we start parsing that way? Mm. Actually, I wonder whether this would let us parse module. Maybe something in here takes visit. Um. Parser trait. Uh, parser. No, this all seems to just be to turn token streams into parse streams. Um, wonder, here's what we'll do. Repositories. Uh, fold, visit, visit, mute. Is there a fold in there? So for, I guess, uh, visit, mute. Do you see a fold? I did not see a fold. I guess this is a top level fold to transform the nodes of an own syntax tree. Oh, interesting. Is a fold might even be better. Yeah, you're right. I think fold might be a uh, might be better because that that really is what we want to do. We want to walk the input, transform it, and produce an output. But it it sort of has the same problem in that these aren't really documented. Like none of these give me an example of what they do. Although the the function type sort of helps. Um, fold macro. Specifically, the question is. Uh, what is like the top level function I call to fold over a stream? Uh, Q self. Um, so what I wanted to do is look at this and see how this does it. So here, okay, a bunch of documentation, that's fine. Right, so this is parsing that. This is basically the same code we're gonna end up writing. Expand repetition, this is really what we wanna see. Yeah, so the body here is the token stream, right? The token stream is sort of what we care about. Um, and Oh, interesting. So this doesn't actually use the visitor pattern, which is surprising to me. Um, instead, it just walks the groups. So if it's a group, then it does that. Huh, interesting. I guess what we're really going to need here is um, proc macro 2. So remember, proc macro 2 is the crate that gives us 
access to the procedural macros in the compiler in like a way that's independent of the current compiler version. Uh, and the token stream it basically gives us an iterator, where's the here, an iterator over token trees that are either groups, idents, puncts, or literals. Um, okay, well, in that case, I'm very surprised we can't use fold here. I feel like we probably can. The biggest problem is that fold isn't really documented. I, I wonder whether the trace var example uses fold. Oh, nice. Okay, let's try that then. Uh, trace var. Trace source let's see here and fold oh is like expression the top level thing hmm as item fn The, I think the real question is, what do we parse it as? Parse macro into args as r. Okay, so that's fine. This is to parse, um, if we go back here. Okay, so this, this macro uh, is an attribute always on a function. And so that's a little different because, okay, so it parses the input, like the body that it's given as an item or specifically a function item. Uh, it parses the arguments of the macro as args, so that's reasonable. And then does fold item fn. The problem we have in our case um, is really that for, if we go back here, um, we don't really know what type is going to be here. It can be anything, right? It's like any token stream, uh, which is why we don't actually know where to start the fold. Um, maybe we know it's a block or we know it's an item. I wonder if there's a general like fold item. Ah, fold item. That might work. An item is an external creator, use a static, a constant, fn, mod, existential structs. No, because it doesn't have to be an item either. Um, like our problem here is this could be anything, right? Like the, the stuff that follows C could be just a sequence of tuples that, that it gives an example of here, right? It could be an expression. It could be, it could really be anything. Uh, and it looks like fold doesn't have an entry for anything. Like I, what I really want is like a fold, but I don't think there's a, just a fold. So it seems like we might actually have to just walk the, uh, the token stream ourselves. It's a little unfortunate, but we can do it. Um, okay. So we're going to start with, where's our no longer in builder. We're going to be in uh, seek. So we're going to be in seek and nope here. This is still going to be cargo expand and here test a zero parse headers. Great. Um, what I want is just for us to have something to start with for our um, our main so that we which we can use cargo expand with right so if I go here uh, now run actually let's make this be in seek and this be in here so cargo expand currently just crashes because we have not implemented the macro but now at least we'll be able to there's something you want is called the token tree yeah yeah, yeah. I, the, I know that it's a token tree but there is no fold token tree um Okay, so what we're gonna do is we have to start implementing this thing in the first place. So seek source lib. Right, so now we're at the point where we know we define a proc macro, right? It's not a proc macro derived like we wrote last time. This time it's a proc macro which defines a um, uh, sort of 
a similar thing to what you get with macro rules, like a macro you can call. Um, and so that's what the proc macro attribute here tells the compiler is that what we're defining is a function like proc macro. Uh, and what that is given is it's given an input token stream and it has to return a token stream that's gonna replace the current item. So if you remember from the last stream, a proc macro derive appends to the token stream. It's not allowed to, to modify, well, Mm, I don't think it's allowed to modify the input, um, but it produces a new input, uh, like appended input. Um, so won't seek zero one million be horrible for compile times? Uh, well, so it's true that if you were to repeat a particular thing a million times, you're basically expanding the source of your program a million times. So yes, it would be terrible. But then again, that's what the user asked you to do, right? Um, okay, so we know from last time that what we want to do here is parse the input to the macro, right? So if you remember um, in Syn, there's this handy dandy macro called parse macro input, right? So if we here use Syn uh, parse macro input, then here, what we want to do is parse macro input um, of, remember how the syntax is the identifier as the type, right? In our case, uh, we're taking the input and we want to parse it as, so remember last time we used uh, derive input, right? This time, that's not actually what we want. This time we want, uh, where's the... Oh, maybe the default is just what we want. So what does it say here? As my macro input. Oh, interesting. Actually, that is what we want to do. In fact, this is exactly what we want to do, right? We want to parse it. it uh, the input to our macro is going to be some custom syntax. And so, sure, we're going to do this. Um, Although it's not quite, we're going to give it a better name than that. Um, but first of all, we're going to have to just like make it not crash, right? So here we're going to return a token stream uh, new. So the macro is going to expand to nothing currently. We're going to parse it, print it, and then expand it to nothing. Um, and in our case, I guess here we're going to have to do this business. Um, so this is going to be a seek macro input. Seek macro input. We're going to parse the input we get as a seek macro input. Uh, and here this is going to return OK seek macro input. Let's see what that does. Oh, do I actually need to do this? Oh, right. I haven't even defined these. Uh, dependencies. I want, oops, no. I want dependencies to be seek uh, 015 and also uh, quote 06. Oh, I meant sin. And here we want to derive a debug. Great. Uh, unexpected token, huh? Oh, I see. Because now we're not actually consuming the input. And so it thinks that the, the macro basically starts parsing here. Um, and then it consumes no tokens, right? Because our parser does nothing. Uh, and so it then says, okay, I'm done. And then the compiler encounters this token is like, I did not expect there to be a token here. The macro said it was done parsing, but it hasn't moved along in the input stream. And so what we need to do here is basically the, the same thing we thought we saw earlier, right? We want to 
basically parse the custom syntax that we're expecting. Um, so if we go back to here, we basically need to parse out this business, right? Um, and so what that's going to use is if we look at the parse module, um, the, it basically provides a number of parse functions. Uh, I don't actually need look ahead. this um, what was that there's a nicer <laughs> parser yeah so you basically give oh I see how they've done it that's interesting so there's parser and parse. How are they different? Oh, we might need the parser module. It might not be on by default. Um, yeah, so parse uh, is anything that can be parsed in a default way from a token stream, right? So we're going to have to say something like, if we expect the next thing to be a literal, for example, then if I understand this correctly, it's going to be something like the variable we want um, is going to be, uh, actually, no, it's not going to be token. I guess the first thing we're expecting is an identifier for the, the variable name, the n, right? So it's going to be sin uh, ident parse uh, input. Uh, let's see what that var is. Hopefully, this should print n. Uh, let's see what it gives. Yeah, so this gives us an ident n, and it shows the span, remember from last time, which tells it where in the original source that ident appeared. Right? All oh, right, parser. You're right. Parse is what we implement. But I was wondering what parser is, because all of these use parse, but I don't think it's important. Um, right, so if you look at the index we're, syntax we're expecting, we want n, we want the um, the literal token in, then we want these things. Um, so next question becomes, how do we get a keyword like in? From memory, there's a token thing. Uh, let's see if I can find this somewhere. Is it a macro? Token. Yeah, so I think this is what we want. So here, let's bring in token as well. Uh, so in is going to be token in parse input. And I guess we can, we can print that out too. Although this one is less important, right? We don't actually care about the value of in. We just care that there is an in there. Uh, sorry, I meant... Ooh, that might not work. Yeah, although that's not actually what we want either. Interesting. Because uh, token in gives me a, I'm guessing like sin token. Like it is basically a Rust keyword, right? So it gives me a concrete one. So I don't know how to call parse on that. Oh, it's probably something like this is uh, input dot parse. Not sure, but oh, is that what you wrote? Oh, nice. Great. Right, because token in gives me a type, although that should then still work, actually. If it gives me a type, then this should be the same. Um, but the compiler might not be able to figure out yeah, but if we do this, I think that should be the same. Basically telling it this is a type called this associated function. Great, that's the same. Perfect. Uh, so the in, if you look at it, just parse to in, right? It's just a keyword. We don't actually care about the value, which is why I use the underscore so that the compiler won't warn us about unused variable. All right, so the next thing we're expecting is... Um, we want a literal followed by two dots followed by 512. Okay, so we're going to have, I guess, um, from. It's going to be a literal parse. 
2 is going to be a literal parse. And in between, we're going to have dots, double dots. Oh, and I guess I want to print out, in fact, let's just keep all of these in one. Um, so var in from dots to, did I miss any? I think that's right. Right, so we get the ident n, right? We get the in keyword. Uh, we get a literal number zero. Uh, then we got uh, dot2, right? So dot2, that is a double dot, which is a literal. Uh, then we got the literal number eight, and that's what we parsed. And then it's saying unexpected token for the, the curly brackets. And so now what we want is the next thing that's going to come is basically a block, right? So the question is, how do we parse a block? What is the type for a block? Um, which, let's look at our parse here. Um, actually, this might tell us the type we're going to use for fold. Whatever we parse here, actually, the body is just going to be a token stream, right? The next thing now is just a token stream of some kind. But is there a way for me to say like curly brackets. Um, so use tree is not what we want. Um, expert block. It's not really necessarily an expert block. I wonder whether it'll let me It's really almost like a module block, like an item item block. Is that a thing? No. Item mod, maybe. No, because that needs to include the name. So what's the content? It's a tuple of brace and, I and a vector of items. Oh, interesting. Uh, you could probably also parse as an expert range. So the reason I don't want to parse it as an expert range is because we're going to have to iterate over this range. Uh, and I probably don't want to allow, uh, I don't necessarily want to be able to support any range. Although you're right. I mean, we could just assert that it's a particular type of one. Um, so what does expert range parse? Okay, any of these. Yeah, but like, Okay, so imagine that I got this back, right? That's not a useful construct for seek. It can't generate an infinite number of things. We don't really have iterators here. We're gonna copy the same thing multiple times. The one thing that might be nice is that we get this, um, but I don't think it's terribly important. Um, there's an impl parse for block. Yeah, but it, I, uh, I think a block is like an expert block. I mean, what, what is a block? A braced block containing Rust statements. No, you're right. That looks perfect. I agree with you. Okay, so the next thing we're going to have is body, which is going to be syn block this. Um, but that is not an input to fold, which is weird. Uh, what? Oh, I need the full feature. Okay, fine. So version is this, uh, features is full. Um, and then you can continue with sub input. Wouldn't block have to be completely valid syntax though? Oh, that's a good point. Block might actually part. No, I think what. Mm, that's a good question. No, I think it just parses it as syntax. And like, remember, macro invocation is also valid syntax, right? I guess actually we're gonna find out. Okay, so we now pass. My guess is we pass uh, test one. Uh, oh, what was the RS 
progress. Great. So we're now going to pass the first test. We should pass without a problem, because basically because we don't crash. Uh, you need sin braced. Ooh. What? Oh, do I need to explicitly enumerate all of them? Oh, man, why? What are the default features? I see. So I probably what I want here is just like all features, but let's do full. Wait, what? Uh, why does it work in cargo expand, but not in cargo test? Oh, extra traits. But why? But why does it uh, extra traits? I wonder why it works in cargo expand. That's weird. Oh, cargo expand probably also relies on sin with that feature added. Is why. So, um, what cargo does when it builds something? It it. it if it finds one dependencies and multiple parts of the dependency graph that have the same version, it takes the union of the features for it. And so if cargo expand builds with a dependency on sin with extra traits turned on, uh, which it might very well do, then it will also compile the underlying crate with that feature on, which is why this compiled fine and also why this, this um, was not working. Great, so we now pass test one, so let's go to test two. Um, I guess, uh, progress, let's do two. Okay, so this, what does this expand to? Um, okay, so I'm guessing this won't actually pass. Wait, what? Oh, interesting. The macro invocation of the previous test case contained an empty loop body inside the brace. In reality, we want for the macro to accept arbitrary tokens inside the braces. Calls should be free to write whatever they want inside the braces. The seek macro won't care whether they write a statement or a function or a struct or whatever else. So we'll work with the loop body as a token stream rather than a syntax tree. Yeah, so this is what was pointed out el uh, elsewhere that, um, that what we might want is to not even parse it as a block, but just as a brace. Like, just, it is contained in braces, but we don't actually want to parse the thing inside yet. Um, although that still means we can't do it with fold, which is a little sad. Um, so if I go to lib here, um, so instead of this, what's the, if we go to here, braced. Hmm. Interesting. Content in input. What is that? What does this do? Why does it need this in syntax? That's interesting. Content brace token is a type token brace. So why does it need Braced. That's super weird. Oh, I see. It just consumes the braces. But why is the let content necessary? Um, like, specifically... Um, specifically, is it fine for us to do, like... Let braces is sin, uh, where's token, like token brace, parse, input? Like, is that a thing that it's going to be okay with? Right. 
Right. I'm guessing why doesn't it just expand to its own value? The real content. Uh, can a file body? What did I do? Oh, this business. Okay, so brace can't be parsed. So it's really, <laughs> that's so weird. I don't understand why, why it has to be called this way. Uh, braces input as content uh, content as input like why is that necessary i guess this is braces oh the content is the stuff that's inside never mind but i i still don't see why it can't be this right this is what i really want um oh because you also need the braces okay Oh man, that's that's funky is what that is. Um, okay, so this returns the braces and I have to write this to say, I want the content to be placed in that variable. Oh, that's awful, but I see why it's needed. Specifically, the problem here is braces really needs to do two things. It needs to give you a handle to the content inside the braces, and it needs to give you a handle to the braces themselves, so you can replicate them if you need to. Um, this means that it needs to return a value, right? So one of those can be returned, but both can't be. Well, it could return a tuple, I guess. Um, actually, wouldn't that be nicer? Wouldn't it be nicer if this just returned a tuple of braces and content? Oh, in, right. Um, Oh, well, okay, so this means that the content is the stuff that's going to be inside the braces. Uh, braced? Question mark operator cannot be used here. Wait, really? That's fascinating. What if there aren't braces there? Why doesn't this return an error? Um, right. Okay, so now we're not currently parsing the the token stream inside. I guess, how do I, can I just say that I want to consume a token stream? Uh, proc macro two, if I have a token stream, I guess I could just walk the entire thing. Oh, I see braced contains a return statement. That also seems weird, um, but okay. Right, so the real question is, what is the stuff that is inside of, um, inside of the content, so inside the braces? Well, I think what we want here is, um, right, so the content expands to a token stream that's going to have whatever kind of syntax in it. Um, so here, what I think I want us to do is just for in content. Um, hmm? Parse buffer. Oh, right. That's what braces give us. Uh, so if you look at um, it gives us a parsed stream, not a token tree. So if I go here, go to parser, is this where parse stream is? Parse buffer. Right, a cursor position within a buffered token stream. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, I so okay. The content is now input. I agree. I I understand the the setup. the The point now is content. So the the error we're now getting is uh, in parsing. Um, we're currently looking at over here, right? This is the current file we're trying to work on, and currently what we've done is we've parsed everything up to the curly uh, this curly bracket. And this inside here is still a token stream that we're not consuming anything of. And this is really what content points to, what I've just highlighted. That's what the content variable is the a parse stream over that content. Um, but currently we're not consuming any of it. So our parsing basically stops here. 
And when our parsing stops there, the compiler then says up here, unexpected token, expand to nothing, right? Because we haven't told it that it should expect to parse that out. Um, and so one thing we could do here, of course, is we could just do like while, is there like an is empty? Yeah, okay, so while not content is empty, um, and then like, a th uh, yeah. Although, will this even, I don't know what this will give us. I guess let's see. Yeah, the problem is we have to actually say what we want to parse it as, right? Um, oh, someone suggested the same thing. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, Felix, uh, I think, no, no, it's, it's super helpful what you do. It's more like, I end up thinking through the same thing as you do while you type it. Uh, Although it, it is useful to have someone else who knows this um, during the stream. So let's see. The, the real annoyance here is that we don't know what to parse this as. We sort of really just want it as a token tree. Um, actually, let's take a look. What did the over here? Yeah. Because um, in David's version, he keeps it as a token stream, uh, token stream, which seems like the sort of right thing to do. That's sort of what we want too. Um, oh, that's funny. Yeah, so he parses out a potential equals there. Um, require braces. So this seems to be much lower level. Does he even use sin for this? Oh, he just parses it manually. He doesn't even use the sin crate for this. So that's part of the reason why this gets complicated. Um, whereas we're trying to do use it, do it with the sin crate. So what does he require braces? Where does require braces come from? Crate parse. Parse. Require braces. Hmm. I see. Yeah, this is why we might not want to use the, um, this is why we might not want to use um, the sin parser for this because here, um, uh, we, what we really want to do is just get the raw contents within the, uh, within the braces, unless, unless we can go from a parse stream to a token stream, right? Like, uh, for parse, where's our, where did I have parse open here? Oh yeah. So what we can do here is actually just, um, something like let token tree is going to be, s uh, s uh, Rock macro token tree parse input uh, content. Let's see what it does with that. Uh, which token tree is this? Oh, proc macro two, right? Uh, and I need to also depend on proc macro two, which is what version proc macro two is version 0 0.4. Expected reference. Really? Well, apparently. Ah, uh, but it can't be a token tree either token stream right because a token tree is just a single um, it's not quite a single token but it's like um it's basically one subtree of the ast so if you look at the error we got was unexpected token was now exclamation mark and that's because this is an ident so this is an ast in and of itself this is a separate part of the uh, it's the basically the next token Right, this would be one token. It would be a group that's delimited by brackets, 
And so if we park it as a token tree, all we're really parsing is this. If we park it, parse a token stream, that should be all of these, basically all the stuff that's in content. So I think token stream is going to give us the right thing here. Great. Right. So this parses out, uh, this gives us back a token stream that is the entire body of the thing. Um, Oh yeah, see, <laughs> same thing, nice. Um, right, so we don't really need content because it's gonna be the same as this token stream. Um, now the question is what we do. So one way to do this is now just to sort of walk down into this tree until we find um, a relevant thing, right? So this now already parses everything. So we don't really need, uh, we now already consume the content. So that's all fine. Um, Right, we're going to need the two. That's fine. Great. So now we should pass uh, zero and two. Sorry, one and two. So the re next question is going to be for uh, progress three. So the next one, now construct the generated code. Produce the output token stream by repeating the loop body the correct number of times as specified. Okay, so this is gonna be, basically now we're gonna have to start to actually do the, do the real code generation. Repeating the loop body the correct number of times as specified the loop bounds and replacing the specified identifier within the loop counter. The invocation will need to expand to a token stream containing, yeah, so this four times with n being zero, one, two, three. Um, great. Okay, so what this is gonna mean is we're gonna have to walk the token tree. Uh, so let's do, do the same thing we did before. So we're gonna stick this into main so that we have a good way to see what it expands to. Uh, and the cargo expand now is going to expand to nothing, right? The the input code that that we gave this seek. If we look at the expanded output, it's not there, and that is because the output token stream we produce is empty, uh, and that's of course not what we want it to be. So here, what we're really going to have to do is um, interesting. So we're going to have to walk down the token stream until we find somewhere that is the variable. Interesting. So we're basically recursing down into the, this is where it would be really nice to have something like fold. Um, but of course the, the problem is that we don't have a top level fold. Let's take one more look at fold. It'd be really nice if we could use fold for this um, fold. Ooh, X, what does X do? Uh, it's not what we want. Yeah, we just like have no idea. I mean, there's fold block. I wonder whether, um, hmm. I wonder whether we can get away with parsing this as a block and then just walking the block instead, but it might not matter. Okay. So we're going to do, for i in to to from, no, what am I doing? From to to, um, no, it's not a block. Yeah, I, I worry that, well, currently, it is a block, but it's like a general type of block. It's not an expression block, right? So I think it is a block, it's just not an expression block. The, the real problem is whether it will allow us to also get at macro syntax deeper in the, in the token tree. So I think we might just have to do this manually. Um, 
So we're going to do uh, expand tt with i. We're also going to sim block is a valid Rust block. Hmm. Yeah, if a, if a sim block needs requires that it's a valid sim block, it wouldn't be. Uh, maybe, uh, actually, let's do this for now. And I'll preempt myself. Um, so expand is going to take a proc macro to token stream um, and is going to produce the same thing. Um, so it's going to get stream, uh, probably clone. And it's also going to have to uh, take an I might not no, it does need to return the token stream, but it might not need the question mark. Um, and here, what we want to do is oh, interesting. We need a we need a way to basically construct up the output we're going to get. So I think what we want here is uh, let expanded is from to map i to this collect. Uh, and then we are going to um, well, so actually, really what we should do here is, at this point, we've already parsed out all that we need. Um, so really, we should sort of stick that into here and then implement, uh, essentially implement print for sec macro input. It's not really print, it's like into token stream, right? So really what we want to hear is impl into token stream uh, for sec macro input. Right, so this is going to have the fields um, from, which is a U size, to, which, actually, let's make it I size. We don't know if they're negative. Um, and uh, token tree is going to be a proc macro to token stream. Right, so at this point, we can do sec macro input and we can produce this thing. At this point, we're sort of, we're kind of done parsing. Um, it really depends on how we want to define parsing. I don't think we want to parse any more than this. Uh, so from to TT. And then it's only really at here when you want to turn it into a token stream. that we want to do the expansion. Um, uh, you can pick stuff from sec micro input in, inside the sec function. Not sure what you mean by that. Um, but regardless, this, I think now in theory, we should be able to do input.into instead of that. Uh, this is going to expand those. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was basically my, my plan was to now do this, right? Uh, quote of, although I sort of want, uh, we also need to use quote, quote. Um, I basically want this to be... Is there a way I can iterate in quote? I forget. Um, it might be that the way we have to do this is 
uh, out. It's going to be an empty, co as a, I guess, a token, a proc macro two token stream empty. And then this doesn't need to collect. We just do for i in this. And then we do um, out is quote. Um, oh man, I forget from our other one. Pound is what it is. Um, expanded is expand tt dot uh, self dot tt dot clone i. Um, and then this is going to be um, out and expanded. And then we're going to produce out. Simpler, parse to, quote, quote. I don't see how that helps. Um, okay, so this is going to basically app keep appending to the token stream what we get from the expansion, and then eventually return when they've all been expanded. So now the trick is going to be to implement this, right? And here, um, this is where we're going to have to recurse into the, the sort of depth of the token stream. Um, and I think we're basically going to end up with sort of an expand inner that's going to be expanding token trees instead. Because I think what this is ultimately going to be is um, it is just going to walk the element of the, the elements of the token stream. So while actually, let's take a look back at token stream. Um, token stream. So token stream implements into iterator. So I think what we're going to do is just walk the, um, walk this iterator and for each thing, basically look for the identifier that we know we're looking for. Oh, wait, that's also true. I need the identifier in here. Uh, the ident, which is going to be a sin ident. Uh, so this is also going to have ident. Let's call this ident, because that's what it is. Um, so we're going to do stream dot uh, into iter map. Uh, this is going to be a for each token tree. We're going to do some expansion, uh, and then we're going to collect it into a token stream again, because that implements from iterator token tree, right? So we're basically we're going to walk every. Uh, every token tree we find and see whether we need to expand it. Uh, and here, uh, hmm. I think really what we're going to need here is something like uh, expand, I guess expand two for now. It's going to take a token tree and it's going to produce a token tree. Uh, token tree. And it's going to match on the TT. And if it gets a uh, if it gets a proc macro two token tree. So what are the different candidates here? So the candidates are group, ident, punct, and literal. So if it gets a group, then it might have to do something. It has to recurse into the group. Um, is a group here, right? Um, and if it's anything else, then it can just return that token tree. If it's a group, uh, internally contains a token stream which is surrounded by delimiters, right? So here, really, what's going to happen is uh, we're going to have to do. Uh, Proc macro two group and have to do this, right? It's going to produce a new one with the same delimiter as the old one uh, and the adapted token stream is going to be expand. Um, 
So this is calling the stream expand of the group stream and still the same I. And we probably also want to do uh, set span is going to be G span. So this is going to be the expanded. expanded. Uh, so this is going to produce a this of expanded. Right. So this is going to map a group into us expanding the stuff inside the group. Uh, and expand is just going to call uh, expand to, I guess actually it might have to do this, expand to of the TT with the given I. Uh, now, this isn't quite true, right? We know that if we encounter the identifier that we care about, the, the variable, right? Then we actually do want to expand that differently. So in particular here, if we encounter an ident, an I, uh, where uh, it is item we want, right? Ident, probably ident we want. Um, and if that I, I wonder if that I is equal to, oh, so this is still going to have to take self. And this is going to have to take self, which means they're going to have to be moved into impl seek macro input. Uh, is this going to be self expand? Um, Right, if the i is equal to the identifier that we were given by the user, then we do something. Specifically, then we expand it to um, then it's going to become a proc macro to token tree literal instead. Uh, and specifically, it's going to become the, a literal that's going to be the current i. I guess i here is going to be an i size we decided. Um, and that literal, I think there's like sin lit from I. Um, although I think we want to make sure that we keep the right span here. So the lit is going to be this. So this is the, the literal we're, uh, this is the literal we're inserting, um, in place of the identifier in the in the stream, uh, and we I think we want to set span uh, i dot span to make sure that if there's an error with this literal, it is tied back to the identifier in the original input, uh, and then we give this as lit. All right, let's see what this gives us. This is probably all sorts of broken. That was broken. Uh, that is totally true. We're going to have to do, wait, up here. Self.from, self to self.expand. Uh, love your Vim setup. Got your config somewhere. Yeah, there's a, a video in the, if you look at the YouTube channel, if you look at my YouTube channel, uh, there's a video on my editor setup and stuff. So if you're interested, you can go look there. I've made some changes since then, so arguably I should do another one, um, but it should be there. Uh, from, ooh, you're right. These are not eye size. These are sin literal. Mm, which is kind of awkward, right? Like we actually want to require that they're integers. Um, so I think specifically, 
I want this to be a lit int. Is there a, is this implementer for lit int? Great. So this is gonna be a lit int. This is gonna be parsed as a lit int. And this is gonna be parsed as a lit int. Now we probably need this here as well. Um, still probably gonna complain that they're not numbers. Is going to be new. Um, so 45 lit int dot value. Oh, is there a lit u? Oh, interesting. That's surprising that this is only a u64. It doesn't take a signed integer. Well then, okay, I guess it's going to be a U size. Um, actually, yeah, no, it's going to be U64. Fine. It's surprising. I don't know why it requires a U64. Mismatch types. Uh, expected token stream. dot into right this is needs to become so this is a token stream from proc macro 2 and we need to turn it into the actual type that the compiler expects which is from just a proc macro crate uh, here from sin ident oh I'm shadowing the I aren't I um, ident if ident 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 Uh, because minus one, two, three is two tokens. Oh, um, that's awkward. Yeah, you're right. The sign integers are modeled as, as separate AST involving unary minus. Yeah, this might be the, a good reason for why to parse it as a range. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but it could totally be that we want to use uh, expert range here because limits. Oh, that's this the stuff in between. From and to are both. Why are they box expressions? Right? This is the reason why expert range would be annoying because I guess we would have to check that the experts are the right type. Um, so, what is it if uh, an expert lit is a lit is a. Hmm. Wait, that doesn't seem right either. Oh, it would be an unary expression. I see. Yes, we would actually have to parse it. We we would not walk it all the way down to figure out what it is. So even expert range wouldn't really help us here. Okay. Uh, that's fine. How about now? Uh, Sixty-three. Sorry, this, you're right. This should say I. <laughs> that was the whole point in the first place. From U64 is not implemented for sin lit. Uh, really? Maybe like that? Do I really have to expect a struct lit int? What does, oh, am I missing something here? Um, sin lit int. Oh, I actually need to do new. Fine, 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 fine. And that gives me a lit int. Okay, so this is gonna be new. It's gonna take the i, it's gonna take a suffix, which is gonna be none, I guess. And it's going to take a span, which is going to be the span from the ident. Wow, I can't type today either. Um, which now means we don't need this or that. And also means we can do this. Let's see what that becomes. Mismatch types. Expected 
proc matro too literal. Oh, um, so this presumably there's a, yeah, so lit implements, I assume this implements from lit int, uh, and I assume it implements two tokens, it does. Great. So here I could use quote, um, but I probably also need, uh, maybe I can just do into here actually, come to think of it. Really? I can't turn this into a, um, token tree literal, uh, so there's a token tree literal. That's surprising. I mean, I guess I could just construct this instead. I don't need to go through sin for this. Um, so I could here instead just do, um, basically go back to this and say, uh, the lit is gonna be not this, but proc macro two uh, literal Um, U64 unsuffixed. Or, <laughs> or sin to parse quote. Yeah, I mean, not clear that's even the right thing. It wouldn't give me the span. I would still have to set the span manually. Man, why is this? Like really what I want is just this, um, but this won't work because uh, literal needs to contain a proc macro literal, not a sin literal. There's a macro for that coming. Oh, for setting the span? Oh, quote spend. Yeah. I see. So your proposal here is really that this just becomes uh, sin parse two. Um, can I make it just? Part? Okay, parse two of quote spend uh, of span uh, ident and then oh isn't this quote span does some like funky syntax so that so that it's clear where the span is I can never remember what it is though uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. no sorry quote 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 span Right, it specifically requires the white space to be like this. So this span to Oh, this is the name of it. So this would be like ident. And then here, I guess it would just be uh, pound i. Right. Uh, what am I missing? And this. Or on one line with. Oh, I see. Or I can just do this. That's fine. It's still not going to be right, though. Uh, I want quote and I want quote span. Actually, is this quote gonna just erase all of my, it is, isn't it? I think we're gonna have to be a little bit clever here, which is, 
Um, do, 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 do. This is going to be this dot map this dot collect. Uh, I this collect into where this is going to be a proc macro two token stream. Um, Oh, I see. And this parse two doesn't know that this is basically required to be valid syntax. So here we can unwrap. Uh, um, quote doesn't require it, but it prefers. Oh, one line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can make a vec of syn types and work with that. I don't actually need the vec of syntax, though. I think this uh, this collect is fine. Um, the real question, though, is punt ops range. Well, that's not right. This needs to be this, first of all. Um, this is now a ref. Can't compare sin ident with this, so this has to be that. Ooh. Wait, that's pretty nice. That looks awfully correct. Right? Error number zero, error number one, error number two, error number three. So I think it generated all of these correctly. Ooh. Uh, you don't think we need the into. I don't think this would work because expand returns, we would have to make expand not return a proc macro to token stream. Uh, I don't think that will work. Yeah, because expand, um, yeah, we want that to return two so that we can use it in here, which means that up here, well, I guess we could up here do in two. Oops, uh, here, dot in two. Not, uh, unclear that the two matter. Uh, but then this could be proc macro uh, token tree. No, token stream. And then this can collect into that. Hmm? Am I confused? Uh, this should return this and now into. So like, it's not clear to me that that's all that much nicer. Oh, I suppose I could just make all of, you're right. This could just be uh, proc macro two token stream, proc macro two token stream. Uh, get rid of this, get rid of this, get rid of the into, just collect into a proc macro two, and then only at the end here. The problem is this now is going to be dot into dot into, right? It's going to be proc macro two stream, uh, no, um, token stream from this dot into a little awkward is all huh? uh. oh that's annoying to token stream from input dot into problem is the compiler is not going to be able to resolve these types for us so I think it's going to mean that I have to do something like uh, proc macro to token stream is input dot into uh, and then like 
output dot into here to turn the proc micro two token stream into a proc micro one token stream, um, but it'll still work. All right, so let's see if we pass the test now. No, we did not pass the test. We also now have an unused import here. Um, what is it complaining about? One of three tests failed. So it expected the output. Oh, it's because I also print the stuff at the top. Let's get rid of these. Don't actually need these anymore. Um, may end up needing this later. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, seek cartridge T. So what is it complaining about now? It's complaining about the suffix. Yeah, see, this is the reason why I kind of wanted to construct this manually because this, um, I think quote always puts the suffix for integers because it knows the type of the input. Um, yeah. I don't think that's going to work. I think we're going to have to construct it manually. Specifically, if it wants it to be unsuffixed. Right here, it says now er error number two u sixty four. Right, which is not what we want. Uh, so we're gonna have to go back to what we had, which is lit is uh, sin. Actually, can I? I can't really construct that with an unknown, can I? I think what I need to do here is just construct this uh, macro two literal um, u64 unsuffixed i lit set span uh, i then dot span and then do this. Yep. And now I don't need code spend either. Mm, don't need, oops. Uh, great. Okay, so that gives us what we wanted. Why is it still printing stuff out? Hmm. Great, so now we pass the first three. Uh, so let's look at progress. Number four. Number four. Paste ident. One of the big things calls will want to do with the sequential indices is use them as part of an identifier, like f0, f1, f2. Implement some logic to paste together any ident followed by pound followed by our loop variable into a single concatenated identifier. Optionally, also support more flexible arrangements like f pound n pound underscore suffix. I see... I see, so the idea here is that you might want to use pound n as a thing that appears in an identifier, and then we want to put together those identifiers. Okay, so this one shouldn't be too hard for us, right? Because we already have this expansion business. And so here what we're saying is, um, if the identifier is just straight up the same as the identifier, we're going to make it n. Uh, if we find another identifier, uh, where, hmm, I guess we're going to have to manage identifiers specially here. So here we're going to search for pound ident uh, followed by self ident or pound self ident pound. Uh, Self 
followed by an uh, at the end of an identifier uh, or pound self ident pound. Okay, so if, um, I guess what we'll really do here is look at the ident name and then look for any occurrence of pound and see what follows it. Uh, so here, if we have an ident, what do we get from that? Um, ident. There's a thing here to get impl display. Really? Is there no way to get the identifier itself? That's uh, unhelpful. Mm. I really can't get the string of an identifier. Uh, that's awkward. Can I get one with like a sin ident maybe? Probably. Ident. Ident ext. That's not very helpful. Hmm. Is it really not? Is there really not a. Ah, through the two string method. Why is that not listed here? Am I just like blind? This doesn't say that it implements two string, but okay, great. So two string. I mean, you can always format it with display, but you know. Um, all right, so let. Yeah, but does implement display doesn't give you two string, does it? Or am I misremembering? Yeah. Or maybe there's a blanket implementation of two string for anything that implements display. Um, uh, ident dot two string uh, name. All right, so uh, we're gonna look for. Where's my down here somewhere? Specifically, what I want to do is uh, split. Split. Parts is name dot split on pound uh, for part in parts. Actually. If parts dot any actually that I is parts dot position car mm, no string where the string is equal to self dot ident. Unclear that that will work. I guess it depends whether there's a partial eek for string. Because there might be. Um, so if let some i. Let's do a collect here. So in that case, we're done. If it's sum, we need to implement. Um, you need to peek ahead. Ident pound ident. Oh, because pound wouldn't be a part of the ident. Oh, you're right. That's kind of awkward. I hadn't thought of that. 
So specifically, the observation is that if you have something like foo pound n, pound bar, right? This won't show up as an ident. What I was thinking here was, I thought this would show up as an ident that's this, right? That, where that is the ident, but that's not true. It's gonna show up as foo, followed by pound, followed by n, followed by pound, followed by bar. As we actually need to peek ahead in the stream when we encounter a, a literal pound, which is also gonna be a little annoying because I think it's basically gonna mean that we have to do uh, we have to also take the token stream here, which is pretty awkward. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Do you need to find a way to stay using parse stream? Yeah, you're right. You might be right. So um, in sin, uh, where's our parse? The recommendation here was, is, is there a way that we can keep using uh, parse buffer instead? Because parse buffer already has like look ahead methods and such. Um, Cause if so, what we could do here. Yeah. So instead of parsing this as a token stream, just have this can be a sin um, parse, parse buffer. Although I don't think that will work either because this has to be tied to a lifetime. Although maybe it's a, s yeah. My guess is this parse buffer is tied to the lifetime of the input. Just kind of awkward. Uh, maybe the way to do this is really not parse the braces here. Well, or rather do this, right? But then still keep this as um, TT as input. That won't work either. Hmm. Actually, we, here's what we might be able to do. We might be able to turn the token stream back into a parse buffer for the purposes of expansion. That might really be what we want to do. So down here, when we're given the stream, we're gonna do this, right? We make a new one of these. Uh, oh, I can't make a new one of these, can I? So this is gonna be a sin parse parse buffer and it's going to be stream parse and then um, actually why do I I see hmm It's a little bit awkward. How are we gonna do this? So for parse buffer, um, into a something parse actually. Oh, does it implement just from? No. 
I don't think there's an impo from here. I mean, unless I'm missing something here, but I don't think there's a from. Sin parse to. Well, okay, what does... Okay, let's take a step back here. What are the functions that I get here? Parse tokens of a source code. Uh, no, parse a proc marker token stream into something. Parse is a token stream. When in a procedural marking. I see that gives me a T, but what is a parse? Is this implemented for like parse buffer? No, I would have to know what type to parse it into, which I don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I can use this because I don't have, um, not clear to me that I want to parse it as anything in particular is the awkward part. Like I basically don't want to write implements of parse because I would have to parse every possible item because you never know where the end is going to appear. So I would actually rather walk it as a token stream. Uh, and I think from memory, doesn't token stream also have a peak? Uh, where's token stream here? Um, I see. I mean, it has a clone. It has clone and into iterator, which is still kind of awkward. Yeah, no, I think I want to keep it. Um, I think I want to keep it token stream and then really just do. Hmm. Yeah, here's what I want to do. Hmm. It's a good question. Hmm. What is being coded? Uh, we're doing the second part of the procedural macro workshop from Rust Ladam. I recommend you look at the first procedural macro stream that we did a few weeks back. If you are just jumping into this now, um, chat needs a way to pin something. What were you thinking of pinning? Um, Ah, that's kind of awkward because we don't have a good way. I think what we have to do is give. We have to give expand to access to the following parts of the stream. Um, so what does the into iterator give me here? It gives me one of these. I see. Oh, the answer to what this is about. Yeah, we should pin that. You're right. Um, yeah, I might have to clone the stream, which I think is fine. It's just I have to clone it at the current point is where it's awkward. I guess I could clone it just every time I call expand. The recursion is going to be annoying too, though. Um, Cause really this is going to be like rest, right? So if this is rest, then now, uh, this is fine. Cause this, this would have to also give rest and expand. Uh, what am I talking about? Oh man. Yeah. Cause no, that's right. G stream. Yeah, no, that's fine. This, this only needs rest cause it's going to have to walk it there. So all we need to do is find a way to give the rest of the token stream 
to expand, uh, to expand to, I mean. And I think the way we're gonna have to do that is, um, is definitely pretty awkward. I basically want a way to walk the stream without, wait, is in, is this clone? If that's clone, that is clone. Okay, so this is far easier actually. I'm just being silly. Um, so the token stream is gonna be stream dot into iter. Here, this is gonna be far easier. Uh, where's my, this is, uh, token stream into iter. Uh, so here, what we're gonna do is while some tt is equal to, or I guess let mute out is proc micro two token stream new. Uh, while TTS dot next, then we're going to do out dot uh, extend self expand to uh, TT and TTS dot clone. <laughs> Even that's not going to work because um, we needed to return how far it walked, I think. Oh, so maybe we, maybe we just do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, this will this will be good. This will be good. I have faith. Uh, so it's gonna do this and the I, and then this is gonna return out, and now this has access to the rest mutably, so it can choose to uh, consume more tokens. And so here, oh, this is gonna be all sorts of funky. Um, so if it's that, that's fine. It doesn't have to do anything special. Here, if it gets an identifier, it's gonna to have to peek. And the way it's gonna peek is by cloning the iterator. Um, and then, actually, it's not even if it sees an identifier. It's if it sees a, Oh no, it is if it sees the identifier. Because the where we where we get into trouble is there are a couple of things we could see, right? We could see foo n bar. We could see uh, foo n. We could also see n bar. No, that can't be the case because identifier can't start with numbers. Okay, great. So you will always see an ident first, and then uh, if. And then I guess what we're gonna do is uh, match peak dot next, right? If the next thing is a proc macro two token tree literal uh, lit, if the literal is equal to this. Then something. Uh, otherwise, if it's not, then we know that what we just got was an identifier that was not followed by a pound. It was followed by something else. And in that case, we don't need to do anything about the identifier. We can just leave it the way it was. So in that case, we can just do this. Which means that we can just do... Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay, this is good, this is good, this is good. So now, um, if we go in here, now we need to sort of search further. So the stuff down here is probably just wrong. Uh, eight. So, I don't know if I can do this comparison, but it'll be fine regardless. Okay, so at this point, what we've seen, have seen, ident followed by pound. So the question is what follows this? Uh, is the next thing the chosen identifier or the repeat identifier? Um, and so here we're going to do uh, match peak.next. 
Uh, and if that is a proc macro to token tree uh, identifier, uh, item two, if item two is equal to self ident, right? If that's the case, then we have seen ident pound n. We might want to clean up this a little, but for now, I'm just going to leave it this way. Um, okay, so now the question is what comes next? So match peak dot next. Uh, if it's none, then we know that we should expand because it means that the pound n was the last bit in this block. Um, if it's some um, actually, should we just always do it in this case? It might immediately be followed by some other identifier, right? So imagine that someone writes like FN foo pound N, I guess it would be this. So it would be a literal open parentheses or it would be a literal group actually. No, it would just be a group. But you could also imagine something like const, nah, what's up? Uh, I can't actually think of a thing that it would be. Uh, yeah, the, the question is, in this case, in what case would we not expand the n? I think in this case, we always expand the n. The question is, why does the exercise talk about, uh, if you remember back to the exercise, the exercise also talks about uh, pound n pound. Oh, because uh, it needs to be, because otherwise the n would be n underscore suffix, which we would not recognize as n. I see. So it's specifically if, um, if the ident is this, then... Uh, uh, may need to also consume uh, another pound. Uh, you don't have to worry about that because at the end, Rust will still validate your output. You can just transform into a new item to move on. Yeah, but we do need to consume, if the, if the user wrote another pound after the identifier, we do need to get rid of it, because otherwise it would be invalid syntax. Um, so we need to consume it from our input so that it's marked as consumed. Because uh, otherwise, Rust would say unexpected token pound, I think. Uh, specifically, because we replicate all the input we get that we don't specifically get rid of, um, we would just repeat out the pound sign as well which is not what we want to do. And so I think here we want to do, um, oh, how do we even do this? Um, okay, let's leave that for a second. In this case, what we do know is that we need to produce uh, a new identifier Uh, quote, actually quote spanned, I guess. Uh, it's going to be the span, uh, the span of ident and it's going to produce, um, it's going to produce ident i oh and i guess this has to be sin parse to let's 
Let's just see what it gives us for this. Well, first of all, I did something silly somewhere here. Uh, and I also did something silly down here. And I probably also did something silly somewhere else, like on 67. I do here? Found colon. Oh. Yes. Find 71. Yes, that also means one of those. 96. Yes, indeed. 72. Can't compare literals. Of course it can't. Uh, of course it can't. Uh, but this we know would be a pack micro two token tree uh, lit stir. Otherwise it couldn't be a pound. That's not true. I'm totally lying. Um, actually it would be punctuation. It wouldn't be literal. If the next thing is a punct, and it is a, what is a punct? Great. Punct. If punct is one of these guys. Pound is not literal string. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Oh, am I really not allowed to compare that? Fine. If punct as car seventy six should say. Oops. Should say ident. And what else do we have? Seventy nine should say. Uh, token tree, right? This we can unwrap, I think. Um, token tree is not an iterator. Huh? Oh, wait a second. What else does, fr um, where is my token stream? Token stream implements, yeah, extend token tree. Ah, oh, fine. Iter once. Needs to be an iterator, huh? Uh, 76, it's complaining that I moved something. Uh, that's fine, I don't particularly care if it doesn't move that. Um, 72, that's fine, this can also be by reference. Uh, 81. Huh? That's fine, this can also be a reference. Don't actually need to own any of these. 83. Um, well that's why I wanted to own that. Fine, not important probably. Oh, I guess our main needs to look like R4 for this to work out. Let's expand to proc macro panicked. Ooh, unexpected token. Where did it panic though? So why is it? Oh, it's printing that just to be helpful. Okay, let's have it not print that. 
but where did it panic is what I really want to know. Unwrap. Uh, here maybe? We made invalid syntax. Yep. Um, pound is not litster. I don't think I'm assuming pound is litster anywhere. Line 80 or something. Yeah, it's here. Doesn't need to be litster. Um, it's saying unexpected token, huh? Um, macro parse two parse two, yeah, macro. Not sure what you mean, Felix. Um, <laughs> great. Um, yeah, so apparently it doesn't like this. It doesn't like trying to parse this ident that we create here. We might just have to create the ident ourselves, um, which is luckily pretty easy, right? So um, going back to here, where's our ident? So we can just create this with new, and all we really need to do is give the string in the span. Um, so here we're really just going to do proc macro two ident new, and then here we're going to have to construct the string that's going to be the be the ident, and that of course is just the ident and the i concatenated to one another, and the span is going to be the um, original ident probably. I think that's the span we want. That way we don't need the unwrap either. And we no longer need quote spend. Uh, line 81. Token tree found ident. Ooh, I see. I think that means I can do this instead. And then I can here do ident is equal to that. I can do this. I could do this, and down here, I could just return that. How does it like that? Hmm? Oh, none of that. Well, that doesn't seem great. Expected one of parentheses or square found pound. Oh, right, we're, right, so here, um, uh, what's happening here is basically we are still emitting the pound symbol, right, because um, here we give in the iterator, but currently because it's just peeking ahead, it, it doesn't change the iterator, so it doesn't skip the pound sign when we find it here. And so once we get to this point, we need to do, uh, we need to set, um, we need to set rest to be equal to uh, peak. How about that? F1, one times two, F2, two times two, F3, three times two. Mm, not bad, not bad, not bad at all. We still have this to do, right? Like it might still be that there's yet another um, that there's yet another pound, right? So remember the case of uh, foo pound n pound bar. Currently, we wouldn't rem we would correctly replace this with the integer, but we would not get rid of this pound. And so here, um, uh, we may need to also consume another pound. Uh, and so if I guess we're going to do peak dot next. The problem here is uh, actually. Ooh. <laughs> we might need to <laughs> if we peek ahead. 
So if we peek ahead and it's not a pound sign, then we don't want to consume that next token. And so this is why here we actually need to take the current peak and store it into rest and then continue operating on peak. But we don't have a way to put something back into an iterator. So in this case, we I think really what we want here is this. Um, only in this case and in no other uh, do we want to do this. Right? If we found anything else, then we don't want to touch the, we don't want to set rest to be equal to peak again because peak has consumed the next identifier. Um, all right, so let's see how far we get in tests. Is it happy with our test four? It is happy with our test four. Excellent. I also really want to get rid of all these match statements. Um, sadly, I think it's a little tricky. There's um, there's work on getting if let to work with uh, and, which would make this a lot nicer. Uh, I think in theory, we could at least do this a little better by saying peak.next, peak.next, and do um, do this. this to this uh, if that and this to that then this and now we can get rid of some of these am I missing something probably yep that's a little nicer See that it still works. Great. Uh, all right, so progress number five. Repeat section. So far, our macro has repeated the entire loop body. This is not sufficient for some use cases because there are restrictions on the syntactic position the macro invocations can appear in. For example, the Rust grammar would not allow the caller to write that. Oh, I see. You can't call a seek. You can't call a macro here. Um, right. Exactly. Instead, we will implement a way for the caller to designate a specific part of the macro input to be repeated so that anything outside that part does not get repeated. The repeated part will be written surrounded by uh, pound open star. The invocation below should expand to whatever, yeah. Optionally, allow for there to be multiple such section, although the test suite does not exercise this case. Each of them will need to be repeated according to the same loop bounds. Ooh. Uh, are you planning on a break? What kind of break? A real world break. Uh, in what sense? Like during the stream? I wasn't planning on it. I have my water. I'm happy. Um, okay. Right, so now we're going to have to be able to parse something like this. Um, so this, okay, so this changes the calculus a little because now, um, now, hmm, this is also funky because it means that we need to, we need to figure out whether there are such repeat sections in the macro body before we decide whether to repeat the macro body or not. Um, interesting. Um, interesting, 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 interesting.
Okay, so we're gonna have to walk the input, and if we find a pound followed by a group, right? A punct pound followed by a group, followed by a star. In that case, we wanna repeat the body multiple times. And in that case, we don't want to repeat the overall body of the macro. Um, interesting. So this is now going to have to change. Hmm. Because I think the way we want to do this is we probably want the I think we want to try to do the inner replication first. And if there is no inner replication, then replicate the outer. I think is going to be the plan. Um, okay, so in that case, uh, so expand is going to, huh? Ooh, interesting. How do we want to do this? The, the problem is we can't just run the inner and have it like set a Boolean as to whether or not it's expanded something because, um, if it told us it didn't expand anything, then would it leave, what would it do if it found the, the repeat identifier that has to be replaced with a number? I guess one way would be to run the expansion in like a mode where it knows not to replace the identifier. Oh, that's kind of cool. So it'll basically be like a two, we could do this in two passes actually. The first pass, uh, does the inner replacement and the second would do the outer replacement. So basically what I'm thinking is first you run a pass that uh, expands any inner iterations, like any inner like pound bracket star. Uh, and if they did something, then uh, then you just return the resulting stream. If they never made any changes, sorry, and they're, they have to not be allowed to expand a uh, pound n. Uh, they have to not be allowed to expand the identifier to the number unless it's inside of an internal repetition. Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, this will be easier to explain with code. Um, Okay, how do we want to do this? I think we want to do this by saying uh, expand ident bool. Uh, this also means that there's going to have to be, this is going to be expand pass. This is going to be, I need to give these better, uh, better names. But let's write the outer one first. So. Imagine that we have this expand that is sort of the, the overall procedure we're going to follow. And that is going to here do um, out is self.expand pass stream.clone and false. 
and then uh, I just mutate it. Uh, if mutated, then return out. Otherwise, uh, self expand pass not clone true. So when this variable is, and then let me fill this out. So um, let mute mutated is false. Um, this does not have the I. Oh, this is weird. Um, okay, so hmm, I don't know if this is the best way to do this, but but the idea here is going to be that expand two when expand ident is false is only gonna only gonna expand repetitions, nothing else. Um, Let me see if I can make this a little bit more explicit. So we're going to have an enum of like, uh, let's see, mode, which is either going to be replace ident of, uh, which is going to be the ident uh, i you're going to replace it with, or replace sequence. And so it's going to be in one of those modes. Uh, so this is going to start with uh, mode expand. Uh, what did I say? What did I call it? Place sequence. Otherwise, it's going to do uh, self dot uh, self dot from self dot to value value oops a map I span pass mode replace ident I collect does this make sense so it for, it's first going to do a pass where it's not going to replace any identifiers it's going to write out the tokens and then replace only sequences if that indeed changed something, uh, then uh, then we're just going to assume that we're done. Otherwise, we're going to walk the range and then replace the whole thing with the identifier replaced. This means that, th think of this as something like, what if a user writes um, in 0 to 10, um, like if they write something like fn x n something, uh, and then they also write fn y n. Don't know why they would write this, but imagine that they wrote something like this. Um, what should this expand to? Right? Because this outer one sort of implies repeat the whole block n times. But this part of the block is saying repeat n times. And so if, if we did in fact repeat the whole block n times, then what this would end up being is this line n squared times, right? Which is just not what we want it to be. And so I think we're basically going to require that the user give us one or the other. Specifically, um, if we encounter code like this, the first pass in which it's only allowed to replace sequences should emit uh, an error when it hits this, right? That would probably be the best way for us to do this. To say, if you encounter this uh, in, oh, no, we can't even do that. It can't be an error because then this would be an error, 
because the first pass is always going to be the same. So, ooh, that's not what I meant. Um, so if you see code like this, what should we do? Um, the first pass is going to replace all of these. Hmm. I think the user is just going to see this as a compile error because this is just going to remain pound n. Ideally, we would give a slightly better error message, but I think that's okay. So this would actually expand only the innermost one and not the outermost one. And that's basically what this expand pass is doing, right? It's first running a pass with only replacing sequences. And if they did something, then we consider ourselves done. Otherwise, we're going to replace the whole block uh, with every I. Okay, so let's try that. How well maintainable are proc macros? Well, what do you mean, well maintainable? Uh, this is not Python. This is Rust, the Rust programming language. It's funny that Rust gets mistaken for Python, though. It's a, arguably a good thing for Rust. OK, uh, let's see. So this first pass is going to do a normal pass the way we did. So I think all of this actually stays the same. We just pass in the mode up here. We also need some way to express mutated. Uh, mute, mutated. So this is going to take rest, mutated, mute bool, um, and a mode. Um, if we get a group, we're going to, this is going to use expand uh, balls. What's that even going to do? Pass mode. Yep. Um, if it gets an ident. So in this case, we replace something. So we're just going to set uh, mutated is true. Also, we only want to do this if the mode lets us replace the ident. So if uh, let mode replace ident i is mode, then we do that. Otherwise, we're not allowed to replace this ident. And so it's going to stay what it was. Uh, ident, I guess ident.clone. Not allowed to replace items in top level pass. In first pass. Uh, this is not for a game, no. This is not related to the Rust game. Um, okay, so that's fine. This is going to have the same restriction where. Um, let i is equal to that, then i otherwise. Uh, otherwise, return that ident. Also, this doesn't. Why did, why did I even do that? It shouldn't be necessary. Um, then we're just going to return the ident here. Because technically, we can do this. It's a little less nice, but fine. What? Uh. 
actually we could do even better. We could say mode here and then match on it down there. That way we don't need the if let. Um, this and this, comma. Right, so if we're in the replace ident and we find those things, that's all great. So now there's one more bit we need here, which is what happens if we find a, um, uh, if we find a proc macro two token tree punct if p dot s car is equal to pound. Uh, is then we need to figure out whether this is a repetition sequence, right? And now we're going to play the same trick like we did previously, which is basically this. Uh, if uh, and then we're going to match on peak dot next twice because we need to look at the next two items, right? And if those are If those are a group, so I guess the group would be through their partition, and this would be the star. Um, so if what we find is this, if star dot s car is a star, then yes, indeed. Actually, and not just that, but also the repetition delimiter, the group delimiter is this, right? So, so this case is we got a pound followed by a group followed by a punctuation where the group delimiter is parentheses. Uh, so I guess this should be... And the punctuation that follows is a star. The other thing we might want here is we want to make sure we're in the right mode. So here, I guess, um, if we only want to do this expansion if we are in replace sequence mode. Oh, you're right. Should say star. Good catch. Uh, although this part is going to be funky because here uh, we're going to have to return a token stream, not a token tree. I think. Mm, yeah, that might be problematic. I'm going to have to figure that out in a second. Um, Actually, that might be an easy change. Otherwise, we're just going to keep it the uh, same thing it was. Uh, P. So if it's this, then now uh, funky things to do. Here, we're going to have to repeat the stuff that's inside. Luckily, we already know how to repeat groups. Right? It's basically what we did up here when we encounter a group earlier, right? Down, let's see if we go here, go down here, right? Uh, we're going to expand it into, uh, we're going to run, where is it here? Expanded, we're going to call expand pass. Uh, let's ignore those bits for a second. Yes, uh, expand uh, as many times as uh, for each uh, ident, for each element, uh, for each sequence in the range. The problem here is this has to return 
a stream, right? This is not, we're gonna replace the contents of that with a sequence of things, basically a token stream. Whereas what this function currently returns is a token tree. So we're gonna have to make this a token stream. Luckily, that's not too hard to do. Uh, I should change the stream title to what's going on. Yeah, this is one of the things I think is the biggest pain with streaming is like, I don't want to have to go through all of the different channels that I multi-stream to and give a title each time, but arguably I should. Um, usually like my announcements of the events happen on Twitter anyway. I sort of want all of these to just be synchronized, but yeah, arguably I should. Um, so I, uh, the real question here is whether I can easily get a token stream from... Mm. Basically, ah, here's what we'll do. We're just gonna assume that it's the token tree, and then we're gonna do uh, iter once tt collect. Because now we can early return in here with a token stream. That way the other code doesn't have to change. Uh, right, so this expand pass is actually not gonna quite gonna be this. What it's really going to be is, oh, I forgot we also need to do this like mutated business. Um, this also mutates. It's true. This is also gonna mutate. Uh, so here, here we're gonna, we've encountered a sequence. So we need to expand it as many times as are necessary, which means we basically need to run the expand pass on this substream with the mode that is replacing the identifier. So how's that gonna work? Well, it's gonna be pretty straightforward actually. Self from uh, value, self to value, uh, map i, expand, mode, uh, replace, ident, this collect, which is collect here is going to give us the token stream, the concatenated token stream. I think in theory that should do the trick. Um, oh, this should be rep.stream. You're right. Thanks. Good catch. Um, where this is going to be a little bit tricky potentially though is, uh, can I set the span of a token stream? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, might not matter. Uh, what else do I have to do here? Uh, I also have to set rest is peak. Because we've now, once we've done this, then we have parsed up to and including the star. All right, this is probably gonna be all sorts of broken. Uh, 65. Uh, 65. Yeah, ident, star ident, 114, delimiter. This should be a proc macro two. The limiter, what? Proc macro to delimiter uh, parenthesis. We might not even care that it's a parenthesis, but you know, might as well do it properly. Uh, this should return out and mutated. Uh, so this and a bool. This is gonna then map out the token stream because we don't need the bool here. Expand pass. Uh, this also ignores the bool. And 162. Uh, this should also ignore the bool. Two. Oh, 
really? Hmm, fine. It's kind of sad, but you're right. What? Oh, that's not what I meant. Ref, that's what I meant. Am I really going to have to make all of these be that? Pattern underscore not covered. Sure. Uh, an underscore is going to mean do nothing. So we're going to go back to making this a mute p. Um, actually, it doesn't need to be a mute p even. It's just this. Five. This really have to be that. Oh, that's, that's so frustrating. Uh, bind by move. P needs to be a ref because ask car takes self. She does ask car even take self. I'm not convinced. Uh, but. Yeah, that doesn't consume self at all. All right, use a moved value mode. Oh, uh, that's fine. Mode is all of the things. Uh, it is copy, it's clone, uh, it's debug. It's probably other things too, but you know. Ooh, okay, so let's, let's first see that we still pass the first ones. Great, okay, so we still pass those. Now let's take a look at five. So five, uh, if we go back to our main, see what that expands to. Ooh, that got some errors. Uh, expected square bracket found parentheses. Huh. Oh, that's the compilation. Okay, so what did we generate for this? We <laughs> generated nothing, I see. So that's probably us generating this message. We expected square bracket found parentheses. Did we now? Huh. All right, so something is wrong. So let's see how far we get here. Uh, first pass. Second pass. See whether we even get to the right pass. So it. Oh, that's interesting. So it runs the first pass and the second pass. And that is certainly wrong. Uh, so the real question is, why does the first pass not catch this? Um, found square. I'm assuming it's going to hit that a number. Wow, it hit that more times than I thought it would. Something's weird. <laughs> Should not have found it that many times. Uh, okay, well. I guess before and then here we have the luxury of being able to use rest. Before, oh, token reiterator, that's annoying. Found it before derive. Found it before derive. <laughs> Found it before derive. Why does it call this so many times? The 
first pass. So confused. Oh, because it runs the second pass. That's why. I see. So really, let's just to make our lives easier. Oops. Um, macro two. Let's make sure it doesn't actually run the second pass. Just so that we can write. So it found it on derive and it didn't find it anywhere else. So the first pass did in fact correctly replace the thing, but mutated was false. Well, here's an observation. This should probably not do that anymore. What? So somehow it, um, all right, what does it look like after the first pass? Expand here. After first pass, it looks like this. Uh, out. After the first pass is just a pound. That seems wrong. Out dot extend self dot expand to mutate. Oh, I wonder. Which pound did it find? So it find the derived pound. And then after the pass, uh, is that the same? Ben, the bytes are a little off. 3730. No, 3738. Okay, so after the first pass, the only thing that's left is the first pound. So the, the one that's before the derive. So this makes me think that, that, that this code, for some reason, ends up replacing the entire stream with just the first pound symbol it finds, which seems not quite right. So do we even get in here? Time to replace. I, I seriously doubt it, but you know. We did not. So it gets to here. So that's a punk. Uh, expand, I guess we're going to have to now have that. Oh, expand TT, now have out. In fact, let's do expanded. Is this extend expanded. Expanded to that. Let's see what this actually expands to when we run it. So it expands the pound and it expanded to pound. So that seems correct, but why does it stop iterating? Why on earth does it stop iterating at that point? Because the stream we get in should be the the full program stream. Right? Like, if I do this, presumably that's the full program. It is not. It is just the very first 
token. Wait, where does stream come from? Am I doing something stupid up here? Oh. What is this token tree? That just seems wrong. The token, so the token stream that we get when we parse the stuff in the braces. What is content and what is TT? Ah, this is something stupid, isn't it? Yeah, this just seems wrong. The content, it's saying that when it parses the rest of the input after the range with braces, the content is just this, actually just this symbol, which is just not right. Huh. Cause like, if we go up here, what is input at this point? Oh wait, maybe I'm just reading this wrong. I'm totally just reading this wrong. All, all the characters are there. I'm being stupid. I just read this as just the punctuation. Never mind. I'm being very stupid. Ignore me. Okay, so we do actually. Uh, I'm being very stupid. So found pound before the derive. Right, so the rest of the stream still has things like the star that we want to expand. Okay, so it found pound before. It's not in that. It is in that mode. So in theory, it should go in here, peaking. It does go into peaking, but it doesn't go into here because it doesn't find the appropriate pattern. So it returns the punctuation, which is correct. Uh, and then it returns the correct token tree, that's what it expanded to, then it extends out with that. So the real question is why does this not do another iteration after that expanded to? Um, yeah, yeah, I know about debug, it's just in my fingers at this point. The debug macro is really nice. Uh, also, Got to use an and else. You move the thing inside the deep. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. That's fine. Um, so the real question is, why does it stop consuming things from the token stream? Why does it think the token stream is empty? Does the peaking not actually work? Uh, <laughs> okay, let's first of all make this clone rather than consume the rest of the input. Great, much better. Okay, now what did it generate? Okay, so it's walking the stream, found a bunch of derives. Uh, that's fine. It walks some more. It found 
found enum, found interrupt, then it finds the limiter brace. So it finds this square bracket, which is this brace. Um, uh, yep. And inside of there is the pound, the parentheses token stream that contains the stuff where we need to replace things. Um, punctuation, found pound before. I see what's wrong. Mm, I see what's wrong. No, never mind. I don't see what's wrong. Um, okay, so it found a pound before the correct thing. It decides it's time to replace. Okay, so it correctly identifies that it's a pound followed by a group uh, followed by a star. So now it doesn't expand on the inner bit. So it expands IRQ to IRQ zero, followed by a comma. It replaces IRQ with IRQ one. So all of those are expanded correctly. So the full expansion of that pound is IRQ zero, followed by a comma, IRQ one, followed by a comma. Okay, so all of that is correct. So it correctly expands that. Expanded to, so overall, that group expanded to a brace. So this is uh, the group that starts at here. So uh, that expanded to a group with delimiter brace. So that's the variant list followed with a, that contains a stream that has IRQ0, IRQ1, IRQ2, etc. So that seems that all seems right. It just seems like it doesn't, it doesn't realize that it's done. Oh, I know why. It's because the mutate happens inside of a group and this doesn't propagate that change to mutated. Okay. So, this is going to have to be this uh, expanded g mutated is this expanded uh, and then mutated or equals g mutated. Yeah, now we're talking. So now it expanded to all of them. Beautiful. All right, so the problem was this wasn't propagating out the mutated to get back from expand pass. And therefore, this call had mutated be false. So it thought the first pass didn't change anything. So it ran the second pass. All right, cargo test. Oh. Okay, nice. Okay, progress. So number six, make working function. As of verse 134, function-like procedural macro calls are not supported inside of a function body by the stable compiler. What do you mean inside of a function body? When you enable this test case, you should see an error like this. It cannot be expanded to statements. Optionally, Okay. Uh, great. Yes, I did see that error. Now what? Um, 
Optionally, if you have a nightly tutor, instead of temporarily adding the following features to this test case, to this test case. But before you move on, let's fix this in a stable way. Check out the proc macro hack crate for a way to make this work with relatively little effort. There shouldn't need to be any change to the macro implementation for this test case beyond picking up proc macro hack. But for the completeness, the expanded code here will look like that. Interesting. Oh, what a surprise. The workaround is also written by David. Uh, Create must contain nothing but procedural macros. Private token friends and private funds are fine, but nothing can be public. Oh, that's so funky. Shouldn't need that. <laughs> Hygiene instructor says that the expanded code can't refer to local variables other than those past Macro must refer to local variable, fake call sites. But why? I mean, it's not very hard to fix, I suppose, but why is this fix even necessary? Uh, lib. Okay, so I don't need these anymore. You, uh, so what do I need to do? I need to do this and then make this, no, where is it? Down here, it needs to be a proc macro hack instead of a proc macro. Does that just make things pass? Uh, oh, fine. What? Oh, right. I still need extra and create proc macro because it's special. Proc macro is the crate that the compiler exposes, which apparently still requires. Um, okay. Ooh. Unresolved imports. What? Well, that did not work. Uh, interesting. So now seek is not being exposed at all. So this really makes it seem like proc macro heck does not work correctly. Uh, don't you need at least two crates? Oh, two crates are required. I see. The implementation and the declaration crate. That's awkward. Oh, I see. That really is a hack. Okay, so that means we're going to uh, cargo new libsec proc. And then we're going to move source lib to sec proc source lib. We move copy cargo toml to 
sec progress there and my this oh never mind and then here we need a source lib bar what yeah that's fine uh, and that's gonna have this So this is going to have a sec proc, which is going to be equal to path sec proc. And this should not have that, right? And this should be like sec proc. And this needs no other dependencies. Or something. Actually, it needs proc micro hack, right? And also macro expansion ignores token curly brackets. That seems even more broken. And this should not be necessary. <clears throat> or this. So I am running on beta currently. So I don't know if there's something on beta that would make this not work. Macro expansion ignores token curly bracket and any following. In the, wait, in our main. Why? And any following. Uh, why? Am I missing something from this? Like, micro hack. Yeah. And this does the right thing there. This externs, this uses. They both depend, implementation crate, using. Why? How is this different? Let's see, is this a known issue? Uh, one closed. Rust macros in expression position must expand to an expression. I see, so this is really saying so this is, the claim here is that this is a bug in our implementation. That we have to produce something that's valid in expression context. What does this test case say? Shouldn't need to be any change to the macro implementation for this test case beyond piggy and broke micro hack. Huh. 
I mean, let's take macro input. I'm not sure I understand what it's complaining about. Because in this case, um, expansion ignores. I mean, this seems like exactly the same error. Expression position must expand to an expression. So this suggests that it, it thinks that what we're generating here isn't valid. Wait, let's see exactly what it is we generate. So here, uh, this gives me a let z equals that, uh, fine. No, actually, I specifically want uh, this, which I think I can. This is legal. How does it crash before I even produce any output though? Right? Like this seems to complain about the input, not the output, because uh, I don't even get to the point where my output happens. Right? Uh, here. Ignore some and any following. I think this is a test case bug fixed in master. Okay, uh, let's do a git, git fetch upstream. Okay. seem like it does it need to be fixed in earlier test cases too yeah because I think I think the problem is the earlier ones uh, let's see new text keep the original seek macro for use outside of function bodies introduce oh I see. Oh, that's funky. Okay. Um, source slip. So this, you're telling me that what I should do here is have this be a proc macro and this be a proc macro hack. It's going to be this. And then source lib, this guy is gonna use, I guess, this and this. And now cargo R. Do I not need to attach that one? Okay, yeah, great. So this is basically keeping the old one the way it was, but introducing a wrapper for the test case. Okay. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, 
I mean, it's nice that it's nice to, so we, we have David in chat and it's very handy that he could just fix the test case while we were running into it. Um, eSeq. So should it be eSeq or FSeq? I guess eSeq. Uh, did I just like read it wrong? Did it say? Yeah, it says FSeq. I see. So this text should say F uh, should say eSeq. Nice. All right. So cargo test. Yes. All right. We have six make working function. Progress. All right. Seven. What do we got in seven? Should hopefully be a freebie. Ooh. Freebie. 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 Yeah. I like freebies. Eight. Oh, inclusive range, huh? <sighs> okay. Fine, David. I will implement inclusive ranges if you insist. Okay, so this should hopefully not be too bad for us. Um, I think actually we're going to change the orientation here a little bit. And rather than store to and from here, store a uh, range, which is going to be a Rust range. Uh, range. Isn't there a... Really, is there a separate type for inclusive range? I didn't think there was. Yeah, there's not. Hmm. Fine. Uh, to from an inclusive, uh, inclusive, uh, is the range inclusive? So the real question here is how do I optionally parse a token? I don't actually know. What does parse say? Uh, ha ha. I'm guessing it's this one. I'm just gonna let inclusive is token dot. Actually, it's gonna be option token dot parse input is sum. Yeah, that's that's sort of what I guessed. Uh, let's fill up our main again and expand. Uh, inclusive. Ooh, so many errors. Expected literal. Did you expect a literal? Don't think that's true. Oh, sorry. This should go before two, of course. Expected literal. Hmm. Uh, are now written as dot dot equals. And you should swap the order. Inclusive rangers are now written as dot dot equals. Yeah. That's what I'm parsing. Um. But why did it expe expect a little? Oh, it's a specific. <sighs> I see. So it's it's really that I have to do this. It's it's considered one token. Uh, dots one um, exclu exclusive inclusive. It's a, it's not three tokens, it's, uh, uh, and then I guess I want to assert, uh, if not, uh, I think really here's what I want. I can't option that. Why can't I option that? 
Oh, I guess I could just parse it as fine. I'll, I'll, I can pass it and parse it as a range. Fine, fine. I give up. I give up. I give in. Uh, expert range. Fine, 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 fine. I will parse it as a range. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Uh, why not a range? Wait, what do you want me to do here? You want me to use peak. So, okay, fine. The I see, so I can't, what does uh, parse give me actually? Parse buffer peak. I don't have a parse buffer. Oh, I see from parse stream. I see. So what you really want me to do here is with the parse buffer, do a peak. I see. So here, this is going to be input dot peak. Um, yeah, input peak token dot dot equals. And if not inclusive, then just to give a better error message we should be able to do token parse input. I don't think this will work because I think this is going to generate a type. Oh, uh, token here. Expected literal. Hmm. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need to, uh, I see. You see, this is what you want me to do. Uh, except this would be that and this would be this. Because we need to consume the input regardless. Right. Uh, no. Uh, eh. And I still want this because I want the variable. And I want the, this and this. Yep. Nice. Ooh. Oh, right. We're not actually using the fact that it's supposed to be inclusive. Great. Uh, and then we're going to do, do self dot from. There are two places I iterate, so let's make an actual iterator. Um, going to give me you know what mm. so because we're operating on numbers um, we can do this. Normally, you can't do this. Normally, these are not the same. But in our case, we can. Uh, except this has to be value, 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 and value. 
and then this is going to be self range, and this is going to be self range. Uh, some big pyramids. Yeah, these are kind of unfortunate. Um, it would be a lot nicer if you could use and and if lets. Um, I mean, arguably, we could like split this, for example, into a function. Um, but there's a lot of like local annoying stuff where we're going to have to pass all the arguments along. Um, All right, progress, nine. What do you got for us now? Procedural macro API uses a type called span to attach source location and hygiene information to every token in order for compilers to appear underlined in the right places. Procedural macros are responsible for propagating and manipulating these spans correctly. The invocations below expand to code that mentions a value missing zero, which does not exist. When the compiler reports that it cannot find value missing zero, we'd like the error to point directly to where the user wrote missing pound n in their macro input. Uh, for this test to pass, ensure that the pasted together identifiers are created using the span of the identifier written by the caller. If you're using the nightly tool chain, there's a nightly only method called span join. Yep, so that we would get it to span including the pound n. Yep, I think this is just gonna pass. I think we've been good enough for that to happen. Yeah. Uh, why don't you use the inclusive range and the range method? Uh, so the reason I don't do that, if you take a look at it, uh, fn range. So impl iterator requires there to be a single concrete type that implements. It's not a din, right? It's an impl. Uh, and dot dot equals returns a different type. This is why earlier I looked up uh, standard ops range and see how range and range inclusive are different types. And so therefore I can't return uh, both. Like I couldn't do dot dot equals here because these two match these two if arms would have different types. I could return a box, right? I could do, I could do a box din iterator, but I can't do it with impl iterator. Uh, all right, ten interaction with macro rules. Suppose we wanted a seek invocation, which the upper bound is given by the value of a const. Both macros and cons are compile time things, so this seems like it should be easy. I suspect it's not going to be easy. <laughs> in fact, it isn't. Because macro expansion in Rust happens entirely before name resolution. That is, a macro might know that something is called mproc, but it has no way to know which, which of many mproc values in the dependency graph this identifier re re uh, refers to. Or maybe the mproc constant doesn't exist yet when the macro runs because it is only emitted by a later macro that hasn't run yet. In this compilation model, it isn't possible to support a query API where the macro can give it the name of a constant and receive back the value of the constant. All hope is not lost. It just means that our source of truth for the value of nproc must be a macro rather than a constant. The code in this test case implements this workaround. This test case may or may not require code changes in your seek macro, depending on uh, how you've implemented it so far. Before jumping into any code changes, make sure you understand what the code in this test case is trying to do. Okay, let's do it. So this uses eSeq, source of truth. Call a given macro passing nproc as an argument. We want this number to appear in only one place so that updating this one number will correctly affect anything that depends on the number of procs. <laughs> I see. Make procs array. Pass proc, make prox array. So this calls the macro make prox array with the argument 256. So calling make prox array with 256, this is going to be a literal 256. So this will work just fine. And this is going to 
call the macro literal identity macro with the value 256 that returns 256. So this is set. So in theory, this should just work, I think. Nice. All right, so this means that we now have all of the things. Right? Pass all the test cases. Good job. We did another macro exercise. All right, let's do a uh, git add dot uh, seek implemented and push that. Beautiful. All right, now what exercise should we do next? Given the time rat, I think we should do sorted because my theory is that we'll, it will be faster than trying to do custom debug. I don't think we'll have time for Bitfield. Um, so I think, in fact, Bitfield might be a good exercise for you as the viewer uh, to do after having gone through this with me. Um, Okay, so let's do sorted. Um, so in theory, all this does is it's like, um, it's almost like a clippy lint, right? It checks that the variance of the enum are in the right order and then emits errors correspondingly. Correspondingly? Is that a word? Unclear. All right, sorted, huh? Uh, so let's go to sorted. Uh, Tomo. I'm going to assume that we're going to need sin uh, 15. We might not need quote, actually. Come to think of it, do we even use quote? I might be able to just remove quote from the other one. Uh, all right. Sorted source lib. And test progress. First test. Zero, 01. Parse enums. main all right Let's see what it says this test checks that an attribute macro sorted exists and is imported correctly into the module system if you make the macro return an empty token stream or exactly the original token stream this test will already pass be aware that the meaning of return value of an attribute macro is slightly different from that of derived macro derived macros are only allowed to add code um, so what they return is compiled in addition to the struct enum that is the macro input on the other hand, the macro, the attribute macros are allowed to add code to the caller's crate, but also modify or remove whatever input the attribute is on. The token stream returned by the attribute macro completely replaces the input item. Right, so this is what we talked about earlier when we talked about uh, both derive builder and um, uh, when we started on seek, how there's a difference between proc macro derive and just proc macro, where proc macro derive adds code that includes like the implementations and the other types, but it doesn't change the originally annotated type. Similarly, a proc macro, if you if you annotate a function with proc macro, uh, it replaces that entire token stream with the implementation of the macro instead, right? So, or, so that what that means is the the meaning of the function signature token stream to token stream is different for the two. For the d custom derive, it's here's the token stream for the input. Now produce a token stream to add. Uh, for proc macro, it's here's the input token stream. Here's return what to replace it with. And in the case of um, attribute macros, it's the same. It also replaces um, the original input item. So it's more like a proc macro than it is like a proc macro derive. Uh, also parse the input token stream as a sin item. In order for item to be available, you need to enable features full. Uh, since by default, it only builds the minimum set of parsers needed for derived macros. Great. So let's do that. Um, here we're gonna use uh, sin. Gee, what even are we gonna use here? My guess is I'm just going to bring in like the the other things that we know we probably need. So proc macro 2 is version 0.4. Um, and we're probably going to need sin. Actually, we might not even need anything from sin for now. Um, 
So recall from the previous stream that for Syn, there's this like super handy dandy proc macro input macro, parse macro input macro, um, where we do like this parse macro input args as uh, Syn uh, args and item. Specifically, we could probably parse it instead of just parsing it as an item. We actually know that it's an enum, but that might not matter. I don't know if there's a, an enum item. Probably not actually. Is there an item enum? Great. Let's just parse it as an item enum instead. Uh, so this is going to be our type. And this is going to be any args to sorted. And we sort of, we assume that it's, that, uh, we assume that args is going to be empty. All right, so here, let's go into sorted, cargo T. Actually, let's do cargo expand first. Huh? Did I do something stupid? Yeah, I did. And of course, we also need to use sin parse macro input. Uh, sin arg, sin meta, builder source lib. What do we parse that as? Oh, interesting. Interesting. Uh, sorted source lib into does not exist, huh? Two tokens. I guess what you're saying is also bring in quote and use quote two tokens. Really? I mean, I guess we could do that, but it seems like a waste. Uh, quote, quote. Expected proc token stream found proc two. debug of this and I want a debug of this unexpected end of input expected ident oh it's not a meta is it um, let's see what args actually is but we also, what, what did we say? We needed uh, features to be extra traits and full. It's an empty token stream. Mm, maybe it's just adder. I forget what is so derive input is a feck of attribute. Hmm. I think it's a me I th feel like this was meta like okay so we're trying to figure out how to parse the the pound sorted in the first place and i feel like this was called a meta meta list 
maybe middle list. Yeah, something like that. Although it's not quite right either. Mm. Meta. Yeah, meta. So why can't I parse that as a meta? Yeah, meta is a word like test in that. Great. Uh, but it's not letting me do that. Why does it not let me do that? I mean, I guess args is empty. Um, oh, I guess, okay, fine. So for now, we're just going to assert that args is empty. And then we can get back to that later. But for the time being, cargo expand of that just now produces the enum that we originally had. Great, and we parse it. So we should pass the first test. Beautiful. All right, test two, so progress. Show me test two. Sorter macro is only defined to work on enum types. So this is a test to ensure that when it's attached to a struct, it produces some reasonable error. Yeah, so we just parse it as an enum item. Uh, I see. So here we could, we sort of cheated actually by parsing it as an uh, item enum. Because here the argument is really that we should use compile error. Like we, if you remember back to when we did the derive builder, we had to basically emit compiler error statements in the output token stream to make sure that we produce the right errors. Um, and here, uh, really what the intention was, was that if the thing you got was not... Um, was not an enum, you emit a compiler error thing that says this thing is not an enum. Um, yeah, but we don't, might not need to do that in theory. It expected that we say expected enum or match expression. Oh, I see. So this is what, mm, sneaky. So the exercises haven't told us yet that they want sorted to work on match as well. And so therefore we can't get away by parsing it as an item enum because it's supposed to also work on match, which means that it's going to have to be an item. And that would have given us the, the right thing here. Okay, so let's do it the way it's supposed to be. Parse it as an item. Uh, and then we're gonna basically, I guess, match on tie. Uh, actually, we don't even need to do that. If let uh, sin item met uh, enum. So I guess where's item here? So if it's an enum, or it's a match. I assume match is a thing here. Oh, it's not, is it? Fine. Okay, fine. Uh, if tie is that, uh, If tie is that, then we return the enum. Uh, otherwise, much as a statement or expression, not an item. We'll get to it in later exercises. I think for now we'll just do it the way, the way they want. Um, I also want this to not have to do this. Um, I want to operate on proc macro two, uh, actually here, proc macro two token stream. Actually, what am I doing? Let's just do this instead.
sorted impl args input. Uh, then, uh, because now we can just do this and not have to deal with it. Uh, because now this can return quote, um, actually it's quote spend, I guess. And here I want uh, tie dot span to compiler error. Compile error. Uh, and it should say expected enum or match expression. Actually, why am I even doing that? Could just do this. Use quote and quote spend. Proc micro create types. Oh, this is a private function, so that's fine. Um, it does a return, doesn't it? Fine. So we'll do this. This will just take input which is going to be a sin item. That would be necessary. Yeah, something's not right there. I guess this is really gonna be. Wait, why is there not a span on sin item? That seems not quite right. if I just do this then it won't highlight the right thing I think like if I if I now go here and take this thing and go to main and then run this what's it gonna tell me well, I mean that business is all fine my search is going to items must be delimited with braces or followed by semicolon. Macros that expand to items. Mm, that seems unfortunate. Oh, actually, that basically generates the right thing. I'd prefer it if it highlighted the next item. Um, there is. Um, no, there's not. I, I just tried it. See? Use sin span span. This gives me a sin item. Input span. Run that. Oh, strict span is private? Oh, spend. Span. <laughs> I can't spell, can I? Great. Oh, interesting. This is all sorts of not what I wanted. Also, let's stop doing this debug print. Macros that expand to items must be delimited with braces or followed by a semicolon. Oh, I see. This arguably should still be input, probably. Huh? No, really does not do the right thing. 
Oh, you're right. I'm being stupid. Because we're replacing the whole thing. And so it needs to... Yeah, yeah, yeah you're totally right. Great. It's still highlighting something kind of weird. It really ought to highlight the whole item, but it highlights only the visibility, which is kind of weird. I see. So it actually wants us to not highlight that. I mean, I guess that's fine. Like We can easily just do that. It seems worse, but OK. All right, uh, so progress. So three, out of order. At this point, we have an enum. Let's do this. Oh, we're, this is now we're getting there, right? Now we have an enum that's out of order. Uh, when your implementation notices a variant that compares lexiographically less than the one of the earlier variants, you'll want to construct a sin error that gets converted to token stream by the already existing code that handled this conversion during the previous test case the span of your error, which determines when the compiler places the resulting error message, will be the span of whichever variant name that is not in the right place. Ideally, the error message should also identify which other variant the user needs to move this one to be in front of. OK, so here what we're going to do is, if it's one of these, right? so I think the suggestion here is basically have another function that returns a result, and then down here we're going to turn that result into a compiler error if necessary, right? So if we look at uh, O2, um, is an error provides a method to render your error as a token stream. Great. So up here, um, the recommendation here is basically have the, oops, have this return a re uh, result, uh, I guess, proc macro to token stream or a sin error. And then this can now return a um, error. What is this? How does sin error work again? Um, sin error. New. Great. Uh, sin error new. Ooh, I don't know what span to give it though. Span. Yeah, see, it's also kind of annoying. Um, the problem here is parse macro input produces a token stream. So I can't put it in here because it wouldn't have the right return type. And I don't want to use the span of the input because I want to use the span of args, basically. So it's unclear what span I even want to use here. I don't think I want to give it a span. Um, so I think actually in this case, the span of args is call site. What is call site? Oh, I see. It's the call site of the macro. I see. So how do I get one of those? Ah, I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. So I, here, really what I want to do is new where I give uh, proc macro to span call site. And then the error message I give is that. And then this is going to be, uh, OK, this. This is going to be, um, unwrap or else e, e dot to compile error, which we can write as sin error to compile error dot into. But we can't because deref and into. 
Great. So now let's see that it still produces the right thing. OK, great. So for three, now we don't actually check that they're out of order. Great. So we're now to the point where we need to check that the variants are in the right order. Um, now check variant order. Uh, so this brings us back to we have a uh, sin, sin item which contains an enum. So we have an item enum and we want to walk the variants, right? So for variant, variant in variant in e dot variants, probably by ref. Um, because punctuated implements iter, right? Yeah, great. Dot iter. So it's going to give us a bunch of variants, and each variant has an ident. So uh, name is going to be variant dot ident dot true string. And now what we want to do is check that these are in order. And one thing we could do is just uh, allocate, basically parse all of them into a vector, sort the vector, and see that it is the same as the original vector. Um, the other alternative is that mute um, last is string new. Uh, if name is less than last, then we return, then we want to return an error because in this case, um, name should have been before last, but it was not. So in this case, it would be uh, variant dot span. So we're going to have to bring back use in spend, spend. Um, and the error message is going to be variant out of order. Um, and then last is going to be name. See how that works. Variant out of order. Something failed. Is that what we expected? Yeah. Now, it also says, ideally, you would tell us where it really should have been, right? I mean, let's, let's first see whether it gives us. OK, what does it expect us to give? Something failed should sort before that failed. Ah, I see. Mm, I mean, this is luckily pretty straightforward. Uh, names is going to be a vec. Uh, if names, if not names is empty, and names, names dot last dot map l l is. Uh, if the l if name is smaller than last. An or false. Uh, names push name. So in this case, we now have all the names in order. Uh, so we know that names is always going to be in lexiographic order, right? So what we can do is uh, should be is going to be uh, names dot binary search. Right, a slice. Pretty sure there's a binary search in this somewhere. Uh, oops, this one. Yep. Uh, nice theme. Do you have a setup for download? Yeah, I have a, there's a separate video where I go through how my whole setup works. You can take a look at that if you want. 
Uh, so basically what we do is we're going to search for where this name should have been in the list. Uh, unwrap or else. Um, I guess we can match on that. Um, OK means that the name was already in the list elsewhere. So I think we can actually do, which the compiler would already complain about. So we can here do unwrap error. So the error type here is what index it would have come right before, right after. Inserted while maintaining. Yeah, so this is where it would have been inserted, uh, which means that the element at that index is the element it should have been placed before, right? So uh, here, oops, um, here what we want is format. Uh, what was the merit message? This should sort before that where that is a uh, name should sort before names should be. Uh, so this would be, um, I guess, what should we call it? Should be is a bad name for this variable. It's like next lex i. See how that expands. Oh, um, something failed. Should sort before that failed. That seems promising. Perfect. All right, progress. Oh four. Um, this does is similar to the previous. We want to ensure the macro correctly generates an error when the input enum is out of order. But this time it is using an enum that also has data associated with each variant. Okay, so in theory that should be a freebie. Ooh, it's not. Huh, this seems wrong. Here, there are a bunch of warnings. Oh, no, this is probably still us. Um, probably doing something wrong. So if we expand this, what does it expand to? Oh, what? Oh, it doesn't emit the enum. That seems like a problem. Uh, I see what's going on here. So we don't emit the enum if we give the error, but we should, right? We should still keep the original enum in there. Uh, and because we don't emit the enum, uh, a bunch of other warnings appear. So because we know that sorted is never gonna change the enum, I think what we're gonna do here is um, mute out, it's gonna be that, out dot. Uh, so this result is really gonna be empty. It doesn't have to produce anything. And then we're gonna do, oh, I see. Mm. I think out is just going to be equal to input. And then if let error E is that, yeah, 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 this is what we're going to end up doing, right? Then uh, out dot extend this. Mm, 
cannot infer type for A. This should be token stream. Mm -hmm. Yes, token stream from. Great. And now this OK doesn't actually have to return anything because we're always going to emit the enum back out. And this input, is we can just clone here. That's fine. Uh oh. This is going to clone that input stream. Great. So now we still emit the output, but also the error. Great. All right. Progress. Uh, five. Match expression. Get ready for a challenging step. Much bigger change than the other so far. Great. Not only do we want sort of to assert the variants of an enum are written in the order of the enum de definition, but also inside match expressions that match on that enum. Um, currently, though, procedural macros on expressions are not allowed by the stable compiler. To work around this limitation until the feature stabilizes, we'll be implementing a new sorted check macro, which a user will need to place in whatever function contains such a match. Hmm. The sorted check macro will expand by looking inside the function to find any match expressions carrying a sorted attribute, checking the order of the arms in that match expression, and then stripping away the inner sorted attribute to prevent the stable compiler from refusing to compile. Note that unlike what we have seen in the previous test cases, stripping away the inner sorted attribute will require the new macro to mutate the input syntax tree rather than, than inserting it unchanged in the output token stream as before. New procedural attribute macro called check. Parse the input as a sin item fn. Traverse the function body, looking for match expressions. Easy as if you use the visit mute trait from sin. Yeah, see, I wish the visit mute or visit were documented because currently they're a bit of a pain. Um, for each match expression, figure out whether it's sorted. Should be able to get the expression. Okay. Great. So let's copy this into our main again. So we have a thing to look at. And back to our source lib. All right. So we're going to define up here a proc macro. What did it say? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so procedural macro attribute check Could be the same thing. We're going to parse that as an item fn. Um, and let's do, let's say that sorted impl is a bad name. Let's say sorted variance. And then down here, we're going to set, say, sorted match. Great. So this is still going to include the original thing that was given with the attribute. So now we're going to have to write uh, sorted match. And the input is going to be a sin item fn. Uh, right? Because it's an annotation on a function. And like before. We're going to reuse this uh, error type of ours. Great. Um, I guess we do get to use visit after all. Viz. No, that's not what I want. Uh, I want back to sin, and we want visit mute. OK. So here, we're going to have we're going to have a struct uh, lexiographic matching and we're going to implement uh, sin visit mute visit mute for 
that type. And in particular, in fact, I think this called out which one we wanted. Visit expert match. So we're going to want that function, which is going to take, uh, that's not what I wanted. Is it mute? This function. This is going to be a sin expert match. Um, and specifically, remember how down here. Oh, that's right. We can't. We can't do the same thing. I lied. Uh, if we success, oh man, we have to remove the sorted attribute regardless. Because otherwise, the, f the program won't compile in the first place. So I think what we want to do here is be a little bit more careful. Um, and specifically, we're going to do that by not having this business and instead doing this. Um, like so not going to do this thing not going to do this thing and instead just do um, okay, so how is visit mute supposed to be used I guess it's supposed to be used like uh, mute f right and then we're going to do f uh, f dot visit item fn mute uh, no it's not true we're gonna do lexiographic matching dot visit item fn mute yeah uh, at mute f and now we still have the f and at this point what we want to do is um, the this lexicographic walk is going to insert the compiler error for us as well. So all we really want to do here is just return back out the uh, f. It might not quite work that way, but you know roughly. Um, great. So here, uh, what we want to do is no. It should be m for match. Um, Okay, so what we now have is a sin expert match. Expert match. So the first thing we have to do is check that there's an attribute there that called sorted. So if m adders um, iter any a a is equal to sorted. If not that, uh, then return. Oh, we also need to add the visit dependency. Uh, really? Is there a visit mute as well feature? Uh, apparently. Okay, so visit mute. Uh, and I did something silly, didn't I? Um, so for the attribute, Oh, I'm going to have to parse it as well, aren't I? Um, uh, ooh, this is going to be annoying. Because what I really want to do here is like adders is going to be. Ah, no, that's fine. 
any a dot path sort of equal to sorted inside the current one. Oh, you're right. I can't even do that. I needed to visit all the arms as well. Okay, fine. So check. All right. And down here, what we want to do is we want to walk all of the arms. Although there's a... Um, actually, uh, we can do a little bit better because visit mute has this thing, uh, which I, ass I assume these functions are the default implementations, um, which means where is visit expert match mute? Yeah. So here we can just do sin visit mute this with the visitor which is self and M. Um, keep keep uh, recursing. And so really what I want to do here is if this is true, then check the variance. Um, but crucially, this is not quite sufficient. What I want is, uh, well, sort of, I guess I want to remove sorted, right? So we need to make sure that we remove this attribute, which we can do with retain, uh, not equal to sorted. I probably can't use equal to string, but it's easy to fix later. Uh, and then we want to walk all of the variants of the expert. Uh, expert match. Expert match. Okay, so for each, I guess each arm. Um, names is going to be a vec new. Uh, for arm in arms iter. We're basically going to pull the same trick here as we did above. Um, ooh. <laughs> uh, I see. It can also be multiple patterns, which is all sorts of weird with this. Um, I like, what do we even want? Like if the user writes something like match foo and they, I guess they annotated with sorted and then they do a or Z this B this or Z this, I guess. I mean, like, is this a problem? I don't know. What if they do Z or a this, what are we going to require? Right? This is why every arm has multiple patterns. I think we just want to look at the first pattern, at least for the time being. So name here is going to be arm pats. Pats is terrible. Uh, iter uh, next unwrap. We could stringify the full pattern, I suppose. That's a good point. Um, is that what we want to do? Can I even do that? Like, does this implement display? It's not clear to me that it does. I mean, it implements two token, I suppose. Um, yeah, like I could, qu I could quote it and make it a string. Um, Was it also unclear that we're going to require the full pattern to be alphabetic? I'm not, I'm not convinced that's the case. I think we're just going to leave it like this for now. Oh, it gets even worse. Uh, oh. 
Like, what if the user writes this, right? Uh, and then they write like x at a, whatever, a at z. Is this wrong or not? I don't know. Interesting. Um, no, only except items won't work either. Right, you still run into the same issue. Like, you want to handle things like pattern structs, tuple structs. Um, I think we do require anything that's named. So I think the options are like tuple structs, structs, and idents. And for the ident, we only care about the sub pattern. I think really what we want here is a uh, get arm name, which takes a sin uh, pat and gives us a string. Uh, it's going to match on arm. It's going to match on the arm. Uh, and if the arm is uh, sin pat struct, then it's going to do something. If it's tuple struct, struct and if it is an ident so if it's an ident a pat ident then we're just going to match into the sub pattern i think uh, so then we're going to do get arm name of uh, ooh i guess option string um, then this is going to be I dot sub pat dot map actually as ref map SP actually, I don't care about the at, but I do care about this. That gives me a sub pattern, which is going to give me, so this is going to be an end then. The other thing that's going to be annoying here is to get out the, um, is possibly at least to get out the span. But let's stick with this for now. Uh, so this is going to give me the SP. Um, anything else is none. If it's a struct, then I want it to give me, it's probably just like the path. Yeah. Then it's s.path. Uh, which probably has a two string. It does not. Why does it not have a two string? Let's try it and see if it does. I feel like it should, but I'm not sure if it does. Um, and the tuple struct is probably exactly the same where it has a path, yeah. Uh. Actually, you're right, this could be sin uh, pat ident i could just like match into this where what i care about is sub pat is sum and then i don't care about this but i do care about the sub pattern um i do think i care about other things than just idents like for for something like matching on the struct, like that seems totally reasonable to also order. If it's an ident, the question becomes, do I match on the 
the bound variable name or do I match on the variant? And I think matching on the variant is actually the right thing to do um, because the named binding is just gonna be a variable name. For example, the named binding could be nothing. Yeah, exactly. The sub pattern is if I write, at least if I understood this correctly, like if I do foo at bar zoo, right? It's the bar zoo I want to sort by, not the foo. Because the bar zoo are the variants of the enum. And so that's the thing I want to sort by, not this. And this is the sub pattern. Um, the other question, of course, is whether, yeah, so path doesn't implement two string, which is a little awkward. Um, M dot arms, that's fine. Yeah, so the real, all of these come down to, I have a path and I want, I want a string representation of that path, which like maybe what that gives me, but simple path. So unhelpful. What does path segment give me? Path. Oh, cause it can contain types and stuff too. Mm. It might actually be that what I really want here is uh, is to I'm surprised the path isn't display. That seems wrong, right? Because I guess it implements two tokens, so. Um, so can I do like this or better yet? What does two tokens give me? It gives me a token streams. Hmm. In fact, the other option here is to do this, but that's not gonna be very nice. I, I actually want to print the path itself. Um, Yeah, I'm gonna need quote, aren't I? Quote, quote. Okay, so here we're gonna do just the sort of silly F this TS into, that's fine. Um, and of course, yes, I do need to include this. Path doesn't implement display. Pattern doesn't mention fields. That's fine. Um, okay, so all of these now are about how do I get a string for a path? Um, okay, path as string. So I know that doesn't work, but let's at least move all the code to use this. So this would be path as string uh, star path. This would be the same. Uh, this would be path as string this and same here. Definitely less efficient than it could be. Um, and now the real question just should just be this. Uh, oh, I guess this is going to have the same property as up here, where this. Where this is going to be 
get arm name. Get arm name of that. Unwrap for now, although that won't actually be an unwrap down the line. Sixty variant dot span. So this is actually going to be arm dot span. Uh, Fifty nine. This. Hmm. Yeah, we're gonna have to figure out how to change that too. I think this is, so this is where we're gonna inject the error if something is not sorted. And I think we need to inject that into the body of the arm maybe. It might not matter. It might be we can inject it anywhere. There is a path.isident. Ooh. Mm. Okay, so that saves us from this one. But it doesn't really help with the others where I want the full representation of that path. Uh, so here, I guess what we're going to have to do is something like m dot. Uh, where's the thing where I get expert? No, expert match um, arms on a given arm body. So box expression. It's gonna be awkward actually to modify this. Oh, I guess actually what I can do here is just like uh, an error is gonna be a vec of sin error. So here I can just do errors.push this. So we just accumulate all the errors that we find. Um, and then at the end here, what we'll do is uh, do that. And then uh, ts.extend. Um, I guess we can drive default for this. Graphic matching default, lm that, extend lm errors uh, into iter map. Uh, for each error, we need to do to compiler error. Great. So now I think the only thing is uh, 49. I think the only thing now is the whole. Uh, path to string business, 62. What? No field errors. Errors. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it might be that we can just do this. Format should sort before IO. That seems promising. Did that really just like work? I find that hard to believe. Oh, hey, finally. It's funny how I think most of the people who watch these videos have not watched it live. The advantage is now you can ask all the questions. It's the real upside to watching it live. Hey, great. That worked. Okay. Um, now that we have some experience with visit mute, thinking back to when we did um, uh, seek, 
I don't think we could have used seek for this because the, the input is just like not valid. It's not a valid AST. So I think the, the parsing would just fail so we couldn't use visit uh, or, or fold for that matter. All right, so progress, uh, six, pattern path, main. So let's see, uh, when we checked enum definitions for sortedness, it was sufficient to compare a single identifier in the name of the variant for each variant. Match expressions are different in that each arm may have a pattern that consists of more than just one identifier. I mean, this is what we looked at earlier, right? Ensure the patterns consist of a path, path are correctly tested for sortedness. Path, tuple search, or struct. I think we just get this for free. See, I knew it wasn't just ident. Uh, oh, so close. This is just, the only thing that's wrong here is that we don't know how to print a path. Uh, or rather, we turn a path into a string the wrong way. Fine path dot uh, let's go back to where's the oh that's far away that's annoying so it, we could of course just render the path ourselves. seems a little broken but you know we can do it um, just by saying I really don't feel like we should need to do this. Uh, hmm. This is why I wanted to take a look at um, the like solution, so to speak, uh, repositories, just to see how David writes out a sorted. Great. Source. Mm, visit. Yes, yeah, so see here as well, David just takes the path, quotes it, and takes two string, and then you end up with these spaces around the colons. But then how do we generate the right thing, the right error? Items of path. Oh. He actually keeps the idents rather than the string representation. It's unclear that that's important for us. Oh, there's also path. What does path do compared to ident? So path. Oh, we might have to handle path as well. Hmm. Okay, so let's go back here and make sure we also cover path. Uh, so the that's path p. self is here qualified with a self type there's a q self oh it's like an ask as thing okay wait so what oh the oh you've posted uh, solutions in here. Neat. Mm. Proc macro commit eight e three twenty. Nice. 
Oh, I see. They're not on the master branch. They're just like disjoint commits. Um, right. Yep, so that gives you a bunch of paths. That's fine. Yep. Oh, I see you make the two implementations common by having them both produce paths and then you just check the paths. That seems reasonable. Um, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But isn't this... Okay. Where does the error come from? It's the myth that's tricky. Because the when I just quote... It's basically, how do you print a path? I see. Okay, so you, you just construct it manually. So this means it does not include like the leading, uh, leading colon, for example. Yeah, um, I mean... I guess we could do that. It makes me sad, but you know. Uh, great. Because I think in theory we can just do this, right? Because each segment is like that, and then join this. What does path segment implement? Implement. Wait, what? Uh huh. Segment formant format. But path segments are also not display. Right? Path segment. Oh, I guess we can quote the path segment. But I'm not sure why. OK, fine. Uh, so we here we could do like quote this. Yep. Uh, let's see. Okay, so. Oh, the span should span the whole path. Whereas for us, it does not. Right? So the error messages are the same, but the span should cover the whole, the whole, uh, path, not just the first part. I see. Well, we already set the span to be the span of the arm. I guess you want it to be the pattern. Oh, this is because you use the path. I see. So the, the, um, the solution, why is the span of the arm just this, though? That just seems broken. Okay, so maybe we should refactor ours to talk about paths instead. So rather than have, oops, um, rather than have get arm name, we have get arm path. Gives you a sin path. Uh, I guess it can give you a reference to it. Um, and that means this is going to give you arm path, 
this is going to give you this, it's going to give you that, it's going to give you this. Um, so now up here, get arm path. Um, I guess really what I want this to do is What do I even want to do if if a thing that's marked as sorted, a given entry has no path? Oh, I guess this is where there's like a, if I read this correctly, it's like a not supported by, yeah, unsupported by. Let's just unwrap for now, it's fine. So this is a path. Um, and I think really what I want here is path.span, uh, but we could still leave the name as uh, path as string path. Hmm. Why is the span still wrong? Because this should give the full path here. Error format should sort before error IO. And this is printed from the path. But the span of the path is only this? Oh, is there, is this where we need to use uh, Oh, you're right. It's the whole like the error new can only take a single span. Okay, so new spend and then I guess give the full path. I think that's, I think you're right. I think that's what we did. Okay, great. Good catch. Um, nice. Okay, great. There's still some like weirdity here, right? Like we might want to uh, support other types of paths or we might want to support them differently. Um, we might also want to try to like share this loop with the loop we use for uh, checking variants. But progress. Seven, unrecognized pattern. Macro won't need to define what it means for other sorts of patterns to be sorted. It should be fine to trigger an error if any of these patterns are not something that can be compared by path. Be sure that the resulting error message is understandable and placed correctly underlining the support unsupported pattern. Hmm, I see. Yeah, because here it's marked as sorted, but the things aren't don't have a path. And so in those cases, um, I think we're actually still in pretty good position, right? So down here, um, I think maybe what we want to do here is if let some path is that, then path. Um, otherwise, um, otherwise we're going to push an error saying that, uh, arm dot pat arm dot pats. See, that might not even work. Yeah, we'll see. Um, and then it should say something like unsupported pattern, I'm guessing. Uh, unrecognized, unsortable pattern. And it should say, actually it doesn't even have to do that. You can just say this. Uh, what am I missing? Seven, right. Okay, and we did something wrong because we said this, right? So there, I don't know if span is implemented for vectors. Apparently it is. 
Sweet, so it highlights the pattern. It says unsortable pattern. What does the test case require us to say? Probably something similar. It requires us to say unsupported by. By remain sorted. Why does it have to say that? I mean, we can pretty easily make it say that, but I don't know why it has to say that. That seems odd. All right, now what? Unsupported by. We're not allowed to omit all the errors. <laughs> okay, we actually emit too many errors. So we emit an error for every pattern that we don't support. Whereas the given solution expects us to only emit an error for the first one. So, I, I mean, I guess that's easy enough for us to fix. Uh, in Twitter, take one. Sweet. All right, progress. Last one. All right, 08 underscore uh, main. to say uh, there's one other common what, what did I miss? there's one other common type of pattern that would be nice to support the wildcard or underscore pattern the sorted macro should check that if a wildcard pattern is present then it is the last one mm, I see hmm well we can do that pretty easily so Um, up here, what we can do is else if um, arm dot paths dot iter dot next dot map. Uh, actually, just that. If that is uh, sin pat, what did we say? The wild, wasn't there a wild card pattern, right? Somewhere up here, wild pat wild. I guess W. Um, Let mute wild is none. Then wild is some w. If uh, wild, <laughs> if let sum w is wild. So this means that we encountered an arm after we already had wild. Well, that's an error. Right? And we can, in fact, break. There's no reason to process any of the other arms. There's no reason to check them. Uh, and in fact, that also sort of means that we can do that here, too. Um, uh, Wildcard pattern should come first. And then, in fact, here we can give the wildcard as the error. Point to the the real question, I guess, for the span of this error is whether it should point to the wildcard pattern or whether it should point to the arm that came after the wildcard pattern. Also, it should, that should say last, not first. Mm -hmm. Continue. If that is equal to that. Unsupported by remain sorted. That doesn't seem right. That's definitely not what that should say. Continue. 
Uh, what? Um, this suggests that we're not extracting the right thing. So I guess P. Show me what that thing is. What is it we're not handling? Hmm? Oh, ref P. We're not handling. Rust fest. Rust. Oh. Ident. Oh, is the. Ah, so this was your point back then, Felix. That the. Oh, that's so weird. So the sub pattern is what then? Like from the opening square bracket? Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. The other question is whether I can get to a path, whether I can make an ident into a path. Uh, I mean, probably. See, at box pattern. Yeah, that's what I looked at, but I don't, that doesn't actually explain it. Um, I see, so I can take, okay, so if this is an ident instead, then, or if I want the ident out instead, then really what this should give me is, um, I guess, I guess really then what I want is an ID into, I guess some ID into, which gives me a path. So this means that this has to be owned, which is probably fine. Huh. Okay. But does that actually give us the right thing though? I mean, probably not, but it's probably the wrong message. Um, oh, right, I mean, can't, can't be printing out all of these things. That's not okay. Wait, we just passed the last one? Wildcard pattern should come last. Was that, did we just guess the right? That's too funny. Oh, there's no associated check for 08 underscore. Oh, I see. So there's no actual check for test eight, which is why it was fine for us to not give any text. Wait, so this means we pass all the tests. There are no more tests. Nice. There's probably like a decent amount of cleanup here to do some code sharing between the different implementations. Um, we could also do some tidying up of how to handle paths. But overall, this now like 
does the exercise. Yay! Well done, us. All right, so we've done... Um, this means that we've now completed... Well, we completed Derive Builder last time. We've now done uh, Seek and Sorted, um, which I think means that if you've followed both of these videos, you're now in a good position to try out Bitfield and see if you can make it work. Um, of course, you could also like warm up with custom debug. Um, great, which I think is a uh, pretty good on time. I think this is a good place to leave it. Um, the as I mentioned early on, no, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, as I mentioned early on, um, the this will probably be the last proc macro stream for the time being, uh, and instead next stream is going to be whatever you all vote up. Um, my plan for now is that it's going to be another open source contribution stream. So feel free to send me ideas of projects you would like to see me contribute to. Um, I'm not going to work on very large projects because it's very hard to make meaningful contributions to them in relatively small amounts of time, like for these streams. So try to find smaller projects where you think it would be interesting for us to dig into them. Um, like it, the contributions we make can be smaller too. They can be things like reading the code and contributing documentation or contributing more test cases. All of these are totally fine. They don't have to be code contributions. Um, <laughs> I get the request about something about Noria a lot. Um, I think it's unlikely that I do a stream on Noria because it is just like not from a code perspective, it's not that interesting. Uh, and I could spend, spend a bunch of time talking about the research project, and that might be interesting, but it's not really a live programming stream. Um, there's also some pretty good, there's a talk up from Two Sigma from last year, where I talked about the system, and um, I did a podcast interview with the Co-Recursive podcast um, a little while ago, or this one. Um, so you can listen to that too, where I go, we talk through basically a lot of how, uh, how Noria works, what the inspiration was for it, how the implementation works. And so this covers a lot of that in detail, if you're curious. Um, uh, if you can, if you have ideas for things you would like me to cover, then please send them, uh, like just ping me with them on Twitter, send me an email, uh, or leave a comment on this video and I'll check them out. Um, of course, it could be that by the time we get around to it, people upvote some other idea over open source contributions, but I think currently it is like very high in the rankings. Um, and I think with that, we're done for today. Thank you all for coming out and joining me live. And if you're watching the recording after, thank you for watching. Uh, and I will see you in probably three weeks. Um, yeah, probably. Great, thanks for watching and come back. Uh, every and any time. <laughs>